Alrighty, howdy folks. This is Ambiguous Influence, and we will be continuing the uh, Pillars of Eternity randomized build playthrough. Uh, when we last left off, we had finished uh, White March Part 1 and Act 2 of the main game. So we're going to go into a bit of Act 3. And I'm going to decide on uh, how exactly I want to do White March and when. Um... So, depending on how far we get into Act 3, I might decide to just uh, head off to White March uh, before continuing onwards, so it all depends. Say what you want about Dear Woodies. They haven't met the problem yet that they couldn't solve by killing some scapegoats. You fight for people because you s see something that there that deserves defending, even more so because someone you trust sees it too. Then you turn around and they do something like this, and the person who made you want to help them is gone. They're doing what they think the gods want them want of them. It's nice that they mean well, but how can you organize murder be their best guess? Although, come to think of it, maybe they're just following Widerin's example. He was purging his own long before Deerwood got the idea, only he was purging because they weren't Aeothasian enough. Never thought I'd find myself missing the hospitality back home. Hey. Okay. So we're good for this party. And we head to Stonewall Gorge. Okay, we got some Fright Hall construction completed. Let's, uh,. Get the lab up and going. Okay. Oh, there's the uh, feral druids. And the encounter from hell. Good, got them uh, paralyzed before they cast the f spell of doom. So let me try and get them taken care of before they end petrified. Okay, petrified. That we got them taken care of. Just take out the final fail druid. That is the cleanest I have ever had that encounter go. I'd gladly shoulder the load, but the pack. All right. I think then. we picked up a few too many spoils. Don't think there's anything. Nope. Lions.
Okay, so going down here, there's a uh, dungeon we can access now. You uh, can access this dungeon a bit earlier if you actually side with the dozens. This is the uh, quest they send you on is to find some uh, weapons from here and that's how this got activated. War wise they basically just sent out another adventuring company to do it. You hear grating and grinding coming from the stone head above you. The chips of Audra in the eye sockets glow bright green. A voice deep and resonant echoes from the stone mouth. What begins as a garble of language resolves itself into your own mother tongue. There is no truer blade than essence forged in bronze. Turn twice to the left and prepare your soul for its reckoning. Oh, goody spiders. <laughs> you should have run! Lots of bodies, nothing good with that grimoire. Oop, Spectre. Gotta love these guys that completely disrupt any and all battle lines. The symbols here catch the light from the racers, all honor to those who have given give themselves the for the glory of Ingwith. A pale the pale stones around the room look dull and lifeless. More spiders. Uh, take out the crystal eater first. Someone leveled. Okay, Adair leveled. So let's roll for his uh, skill increase. Seven, so that's actually going to be mechanics. And then one, two, only two can take the five. That's going to be mechanics again. Talents, it's going to be from, let's see which category. Utility. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So just roll our d10. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Damage reduction on shock. Hey. Various and sundry spirits. Let the melee happen. Hey. Approach and make yourself known to me. The stone faces Audra's eyes glow, and a voice rumbles from its open mouth. The past is the hilt of a weapon. The true Rory grasps it and know his strength. Speak the quality that defies you. I bring people together, and I am at my best when working alongside my allies. 
So it is with your power. A symbol burns in the wall behind the stone head. We're gonna put on scouting mode to see if we can find anything. Okay, let's take the shade out first because that should be fairly easy. And then take out the Kangrilla. Sangrilla, I should say. talk to this guy as a green light spells from the relief's eyes you hear another deep rough-edged voice desire is the aim of the soul its purpose and direction the sharpened point of a blade speak your ambition that your soul may strike true i aimed to become a mightier version of who i am today so it shall be the symbol glows to life on the wall it pulses with light smoldering against the lichen covered wall a vessel of flesh may house a soul for years, but a vessel of bronze will house a soul for generations. Enter the water and choose a vessel of stone. Hey. Let's make spiders. Get the crystal eater because it can petrify and also cast down the ice like that. Uh, take out the spinner real quick while well, the other one's dominated. Get some free hits on the dominated. There we go. You feel an unwelcome crawling sensation in your head. A high pitched ring overwhelms your senses and is, and is accompanied by an angry utterance Invader! Thief! The voice is alien and fierce, jolting through your mind like lightning. Needles stab at your brain with every syllable, but vanish abruptly along with the words. The ringing in your head is gone. Hey. The serpentine symbols and icons of Engwith engraved into the floor resolve into words in your mind. The warrior shall call forth two witnesses, and they shall take up positions upon the emblems that bear testament to the character of the soul. The warrior shall ascend the dais, soul vessel in hand, to undergo transference. Bearing his soul vessel and a weapon with a heart of Audra, the warrior may then approach the urn. In this way he shall fashion an arm worthy of his skills and ambitions. Hey. So to get that vessel, we're going to want to go down through here. The large tunnel, this large tunnel curves underneath the floor and continues to the east. It's blocked by glistening ropes of webbing that you might be able to slide past. The walls beneath the webbing feel weak and crumbly. With the proper tools, you might be able to widen the passage. Widen the tunnel with a hammer and chisel. You find a weak point in the rock and hammer at the walls of the passage. The brittle stone crumbles away. Within minutes, you've created enough room to slip through the tunnel. As you clear a passage, the needle-like voice digs into your skull once more. Infiltrating, pursuing, you shall not have it. You will hear a hungry chittering. Now, feed! Skittering creatures with gnashing mandibles pour from the walls. Yay! Okay. Enter the tunnel. More spells to go through. Okay. 
Shattered crystal crunches and crunches and tinkles underfoot. Mm, tinkly crystal. There's a word. A robed, gangling creature rushes towards you, and you feel something needling at your brain again. The screeching hiss that invades your mind is an edged with rage. Digging in, frettering animal, it pauses, its mouthpieces clacking. When its words fill your mind again, they're tempered with fear. My legacy. It clutches an egg-like stone in its spindly fingers. The white stone glows with life, and you feel a presence inside. The creature notices your interest and squeals, its mandibles wide. No, for the colony, not for a cruel, hungry animal. The challenge echoes back at you from within the stone. It occurs to you that a piece of the creature's soul is somewhere housed within it. What are you doing with that stone? Such a different form, and yet its mind is alive with the same thoughts as ours. Home, family, memory. Legacy, colony, its segmented mouth parts scraped together. Young are always few, so to hatch, fragile. The creature indicates itself with the hairy appendage, last of colony, soon to die. It draws the stone closer to its narrow chest. Long did animals put spirit stuff in metal. It points behind it. I keep spirit stuff in stone. Take it to new colony. Colony alone is weak, young, frail, empty of wisdom. But two colonies together survive, make strong colony. It strokes the stone. Need legacy to guide new colony, keep it strong. You're not going anywhere, monster! Again, the dice lead to murder. Its mantles rattle and click, and it squeals at a frequency that you can only just hear. Spiders emerge from the shadows. Okay. Let's kind of form up here. Never dare knock him down. Oh, okay, yeah. This, they're just up on Widow. Up on Widow. Up on Grieving Guys, I should say. I mean, yes, most of these are fairly weak-ass spiders, but still. Fairly weak-ass in big numbers. Okay, we got the soul vessel. In Claude Haliathe. I butchered that pronunciation. Hey. Head back here. Yes. Hey. Hey. Okay. Approach the dais with the vessel in hand. Okay. Ready when you are. Power is sacrificed. To draw strength from yourself, you must draw from a portion of your soul. Would you bear your essence in this vessel? Yes, I would. You approach the strange light filtering from the Audra and the floor, while a face carved from the green stone stares down at you. A rush of sensation overwhelms you. An unearthly shriek fills your ears while your skin prickles with static energy. All at once, something constricts within you. You gasp for breath, but find none. That's when the pain begins. The agony is like nothing you've ever experienced. Something sears you from the inside, ripping your essence apart, yet your body is rooted to the spot. Only your soul trembles within you. Just as quickly as it began, the sensation ends. 
When you pant for breath, you notice that the soul vessel in your hands glowing. Within, you feel your own essence, like an echo of your own thoughts. The sacrifice is made. Zawa is ready. Okay. And this allows us to uh, make the uh, Clad Hyliath, uh, Hyliath an Ingwithan Soul Spear. Um, and basically, the enchantments here were determined by what we uh, gave, the answers we gave. Um, like, I'm good with my allies gave us that plus four accuracy and dam in 25 damage when attacking same target as an ally, and then I think the other one just gave us the uh, that upgrade. Yep, so it's coordinating and exceptional. Hey. And that's just an item you can find here. So we're going to head back over to here. The stairs have collapsed, leading to a long drop to the floor below. Anchor our grappling hook to the edge and climb down. You secure, secure grappling hook to the cleft of the broken stairs and toss the line down. As you slide down the rope, the rushing of water rumbles in your ears. It sounds as though the lake from the gorge is still draining into some distant reservoir. Suddenly, a violent tremor rocks the cavern, and you feel your group loosen from the rope. However, you manage to cling to the line until the quake subsides. You reach the bottom, your feet splashing in a puddle of water. And then this is the uh, underside of the. Oh, meant to grab everyone. Hey. The under portion. Nothing will slip past me. Go into scouting mode. Would you look at that? Just a girdle of constitution. He doesn't have anything. He already has one. He already has one. You know, might as well grab one for a dare. More hit points on the main tank. Always a good thing. Okay, and we're within going to the troll. Hey. Alrighty. And howdy there, folks. How are you doing tonight? Okay, that troll's coming on over here. So let's form up where... Bad <coughs> folks, if we could uh, form up. Oh, it doesn't come into the pit. It just circles around. Domination working over time there. Come on. Hey. Okay. Grab whatever's here. Pearls? Pearl. Yep. Keeping an eye out. Head on over here. Fast mood. Sp 
Power links. Just take him out with some application of violence. See if we can disarm this trap. Sorry, I don't call forth the Stelgar just to haul your garbage. Oh. Of course. Souls bound in eternity. Can't take out these two spoilers. And head on out of the cave. Okay. And that brings us down here. And this was an area currently inaccessible until uh, Ash 2 was completed. There were floodwaters here before. Letting he was a well, well, well. A woman in robes, flanked by an armed group, savors every word before whispering the next, Finally. You shall have remained in Defiance Bay. She draws a smile, pale and full, that droops below her recessed chin. But I'm glad you didn't have a better sense. I've looked forward to this since you got in our way. Any last words? After all your effort you've mustered, it'll be a shame for it to end quietly. Haven't you heard what I do to my enemies? Surrender, unless you want a taste of my anger. The complacent smile of the woman still vanishes. You, she gives a sideways glance to her henchman. Yes, I've heard. A corpulent man, muscled beneath rolls of fat, snaps his head in a woman's direction. I've heard it too. Kills without thinking twice, this one. The jowls under his chin quiver as he spits the words out. By the flame, Neil, let it go. Shut up! The command rustles through her clenched teeth. A cowled man, clean, cleaning his fingernails with the point of a long stiletto. That's just stupid to do, my dude. One step and... <laughs> Doesn't let the science last. I told you he had too big, of, big a mouth, boss. He spreads his fingers apart and gives them a good look. But if the oaf's got it right, I'm not here to die for nothing. The woman's shoulders drop. Winds take you. At what point did I promise an easy job? She stares at the ground, her lips hanging down like ripe fruits. How do I know you'll spare us if I give up? I always stand by my word. That was the rumor, too, before you hired us. Is this in the gift? The fighter hammers his fat finger against his temple. I remember I do. The worm bites on her lower lip, flushing it red, and shakes her hand. Would I have mercy? She locks eyes on you. Take me away. Anywhere. Anywhere's better than here. Huh. Okay. Hey. And so the dice decided for mercy. I wonder if they're sick. Just kind of revealing the map. Dead adventurer. Spotted stealth guard. Oh, a whole squadron of kids. Just to do the good old focused fire. That's how it's done. All right, then. I 
Ah, yes, the dank spores. Better try something else. Have Zaur go for slashing weapons, because these things have, like, no defense against slashing. Like, four damage reduction. It's just... Mm. Swamp Spore. Oh, oh, and of course the Swamp Spore has, like, fantastic reduction against slashing. I see what you're doing there, trying to fake me out. Yes. Of course. Can't just keep revealing the map. But a quick save in just in case. And if you didn't want to go through the dungeon, this is just the switchback that you could go down. Like you'll see here, this is basically where we stopped beforehand because this is where the waters were. Just reveal this area. Yeah, that's pretty much just that. So let's uh, venture forth. To Elmshore. Okay, so typically, uh, is typically I keep this on standard rather than scale it up, but especially because of the uh, randomized build, I'm just keeping this on standard. Explore this area around here. That's a lot of ogres. Now I'll focus on that druid. I have Haravius cast one of the storms. Take advantage of the domination. Yes. Okay, let's all get out all right. of the insect swarm. Oh no, it just attaches to us. Wonderful. And this is why I target druids, okay? Let's get you healed up there, yeah? Why not? This isn't going very well. Okay, kitty cat murder time. Is that a deer? Oh, that's Clarence. Where's a deer? Not 
quite sure where our deer is, so I can't really target him all that well to bring him back. So let's bring in the phantom. Okay, some chain lightning. Totally doable. He's hit five. Do your resurrection ability there, kinda. Well, revitalize, I should say. <laughs> Gravious call down lightning. Clarence. Do the petrification. Petrified ogres, real quick. Take advantage of that double damage as much as you can, which we've already done, and finish off that final ogre. Hey. Hey, kidoki. Cushion, rich knee, raised ribs, raised ribs. Hey. Hmm. Oh, so she's actually my prison now, that hey. Leverton Key assassin. Huh. in here. Put a quick save down. Bears. That's how it's done. Do our petrification there. Target you. Storm. Knock down. Just attack. Just attack. Need to try something else. Try that petrification spell again. Oh, that's why this clearance is very cool. It's going to down. Oh, there we go. Can we please hit? There we go. Take out the druid. This one who's a priest. Okay, 
cast detonate on the bear. Leave it to me. And there we go. Hey. Nethred the Rise's head. Oh, that was a bounty. I'll tinker with that. What could go wrong? All done. Cloak of minor missiles. Hmm. Not bad. Fenwalkers. Not bad. Hey. I shall be quiet as a calm sea. Which is not very quiet. So since I actually got a bounty in because my people are looking banged up, I'm actually gonna head back to Cat Nua, turn that in, then rest. But first let's level up Kana. We've got some lore. And nothing can take a three. So one, two, three, four, five. Three. Seven nights she waited while the white winds wept. Attacks enemies in seven directions around the chant with bolts of freezing ice. So it's a foe target for high freeze damage. Again, I was hoping we would get something like summons two ogres or summons a drake, but nope. Okay, talent. Utility talent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So roll RD ten. One. Fast runner. Plus one movement speed, plus five defense when disengaging. Not actually the worst. Hey. New variability is never a bad thing. Okay, so let's head back to Cat Nua. Uh, Barnaby86 says, hey, hello. Uh, how's your night going? Hope you had a good week. Right, all construction of the lab complete. And we have a visitor. So let's build the courtyard pool. Go to the warden. Going all right, not sure what I want to play this weekend. Well, you know, that's a good problem to have. Oh, I started a Pillars of Eternity, uh, Path of, is that a Pillars of Eternity or Path of Exile? Because I know those are both, uh, <laughs> uh, PoE games. Pillars, yeah. Yeah, Pillars 2 is a fun one. Uh, Deadfire. Hello. Uh, now rent. Hey. Yeah, when I finish up this one, I do want to uh, do Pillars 2 with the same character. Import the save and all that. Beautiful as it can be with the absence of children. Okay, let's rest. White March is, uh, I would definitely recommend playing White March. It is, at first I was like, okay, they're kind of doing a, uh, Icewind Dale homage because of the setting, but especially once you get in, oh. As you sleep, you are buoyed and buffeted by the vagaries of dreams. They tumble and thrash around you and fill your mind's eye with pale, glittering motes. They resolve into a light snowfall and a biting northern, northerly wind. You recognize the mountains of the right march rising above you, and you shiver. You see stalwart a few miles away, quiet and still, but for a few curling streams of smoke rising from the chimneys. Durgan's battery is perched above it, its shadows stretching into the valley. Above it all, 
you hear a deep, slow rhythm. At first, it sounds like a distant drumming, but then it grows louder, cracking through the dry air and booming from the mountain peaks. It builds until you feel it reverberating beneath your feet. Watch and listen. Each thud comes louder and faster than the next. Thunder echoes from the mountaintops as great sheets of ice and snow tumble down the slopes. But the rhythm keeps building, shattering frozen lakes like crystal saucers. New ravines split through the mountains as old chasms full of snow and scree. A rock sideberry stalwart in Durgan's battery is shaking to rubble. Shadows rise out of the mount over the mountains, the vanguard of a massive army. You flee. You tumble from the foothills and bound across the deerwood, fleeing the rubble of the advancing army all the while. Barricade yourself in Cadnua. Cadnua rises from the forest, its mended walls reaching out to you like a pair of strong arms. You barricade yourself within the Great Hall as the pounding grows closer still. It rattles the foundations of the Great Keep, and just as the masonry begins shaking loose, you hear an unholy battle cry coming from the courtyard. The ceiling collapses and sends a cascade of bricks and beams onto your head. You struggle to wakefulness, kicking at the bedding knotted around your legs. As you shake free of the last bonds of sleep, you hear a voice whisper something in a language you've never heard, and see you see an image of a hundred shifting, staring eyes. You waken, feverishly warm and covered in sweat. Hey. Okay, so that's the cue that we can do uh, Act 2 of White March now. So White March is actually a really interesting... Um, Durgan's Battery is a fun dungeon. Uh, you get access to the uh, Durgan Steel upgrades from it, uh, which just lets you enhance any weapon, flat, or I believe armor as well. And then in White March 2, without spoiling anything, it goes in a, uh, it really, um, it deals with some of the relationship between Abaddon and Andra, and the ties between them, and especially like Going through White March in its entirety, and then going into, uh, actually, it, depending on what you do in White March in its entirety, it can affect uh, some things in Dead Fire. Uh, in, well, not like big effects, but like in terms of uh, Abaddon and how he uh, appears. Um, basically after the main combat climax of White March 2, you actually engage in a debate with some entities. And depending on what arguments you use and what actions you've taken, uh, you can actually, like, change their mind and, like, uh, temper somewhere their vision it's a really interesting um, end to the DLC. Uh, so I, I really, plus like uh, it has some great characters in it as well. That's where you pick up Zawa, uh, who's actually I think my favorite party member in the game. Uh, it has some quests. It has a lot of the uh, soulbound items in it, which are a lot of fun. So really, White March is definitely, uh, definitely worth the while. So we are now leveling up Grieving Mother to level 12. Let's see what skill she's going to get. Lower. And the only one that can take the forest mechanics. She's going to get Amplified Wave, because it's the only choice. What level do you recommend for White March 1? Eh. It's hard to say. Um, I would say at least eight, um, at least eight. And that's, that's kind of a rough guesstimate. Uh, oh, sorry. Yep. Offensive. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2. Okay, breaking out the D30. So 
16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Primal Bane. Oh yeah, and another part of the um, White March DLC, even though you don't actually have to uh, touch White March at all to play it, well, you do for the second part, but the uh, stuff at Cragholt Bluffs in Console Hot's Castle is was part of the white march part one and when you complete that and go to stalwart and and at least like white march part two you uh unlock an entire area in like a swamp area uh that deals with the uh people who hired the torn bannerman to go after consul hot uh and if you have a mage anywhere in your party, taking on Consul Hot is... He's a very difficult encounter, but he is worth it, simply for some of the spells in his Grimoire. Okay, and my lord, I don't wish to trip you, but I could use your help in a personal matter. Very well, let's hear it. You call your allies together and motion for the petitioner to step forward. And the stuff with uh, Consul Hart and his uh, opposition does uh, show up in Deadfire, particularly in some of the DLCs on Deadfire. Uh, this is harder to say than I thought it'd be. My name is uh, Odina. I fought in the Saints War, same as most of my kin. I followed orders, no more. But between one thing and another, I guess I made a reputation for myself. They call me a hero. Every street I walk down, I get handshakes and comments. The dozens, they act like I'm some figurehead for their schemes. The things I've done, I don't get much sleep. But the last thing I need is all this attention. All I want is some peace. Please, you're the only one I can turn to. You shouldn't hide from your past. It's not so simple. I don't have a choice in the matter. Every day, people remind me of the things I've done, things I'm still not sure were the right thing to do. You upset that people praise you. You're an ingrate and a coward. Maybe. I suppose that answered enough in my case. Thank you for your time, my lord. Odena's impassive expression doesn't betray any anger or resentment. She bows her head curtly and turns away. Okay. So we are going to head back to Elmshore. Oh yeah, and uh, like, well, I would say like around level eight or so is good for White March Part One. I would wait until you're like not as beautiful as the Anguithin ruins near my home. At least fourteen to sixteen, like end game before you do uh, Torn Bannerman stuff in Console Hot, because that is some of the toughest stuff in the game. Like, honestly, I typically don't do console hot until I've actually, like, completed uh, all of White March Part 1 and 2. And am at, like, the very tail end of Act 3 before you hit the point of no return. So I actually am going to drop Not Grieving Mother out and bring in Sagani. Because I think in Elmshore... There might actually be the final part she needed for her uh, quest. Audra Arch, dead ahead. Yep. Ha ha. Yes. But first, let's get her, her levels real quick. That's some athletics. Nothing can take the three. Offensive talents. Break out the D30. Eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, in Venom Strike. Nice. 
Athletics. Only Laura can take the four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven for abilities. So let's roll that d12. One. Swift Aim, a modal. Which is more. I believe that's more attack speed. I'm here. Yeah, more attack speed, more reload speed, but less accuracy. As opposed to Vicious Aim, which is less attack speed, less reload sp speed, but more accuracy, more damage. Hey. Yeah, I put in a quick save. <laughs> okay, there is an Odrig in there. I want to have you kitty cat. Kind of just sneaky deek around here, her obvious. Take out the caster as best you can. Oh, yeah, that'll do. Until you get confused. I don't think they can actually get out of the storm. Uh, that's the eye dragon. Okay, y'all. Focus the caster. Oh, Heravius is back. Y'all focus the beetle, except Heravius, you focus the caster. Come on, Heravius, you can do it. If you're not knocked down. Yeah, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally matching this fight well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying there are other things I could have done if I hadn't been tunnel visioning uh, Heravius going kitty cat and just killing everything, but. Yeah, yeah there's other things I could have done. Okay, let's kill the forest lurkers. Because they're not on the goddamn moonwell that keeps healing her. That's making most things a futile. Okay, now just just kill it. Hard and fast. Come on, folks. Okay, that took him. That was not my greatest tactical moments. <laughs> It started off promising, but uh, it fell apart a bit. The Ultra Arch looms in front of you. Just as you saw it through Persox's eyes, Sagani turns, watching the trees for movement. As the arch, Archer Shadow falls off you, the wounded shore fades into a different scene. The wooded shore, wounded shore. You are standing in another forest. Blackened, bare trunks claw their way out of the soil and keep a solemn vigil over the young trees and tender shrubs. You move slowly through the woods and the ruins scattered around them. Stone pillars and broken arches show their bones, show the bones of some destroyed building. Between and amidst it all are elves and orlands, their faces painted and their bows drawn. Examine the trees. The stunted, charred trunks look like the aftermath of the War of Black Trees. Battles were fought all over the Deerwood and Air Glanfoth, and many of the deadliest fronts developed along the borders and behind major Glanfoth and settlements. Burnt trees, crumbling ruins, where is this? I'm glad you don't recognize it. That suggests you haven't been looking around ruins where you don't belong. Her obvious eyes you intently with a wagging finger of feigned lecturing. Sounds like you're describing the desolate stretch in the mountain slopes near slopes north of Twin Elms. Side of an old battle from the War of Black Trees. I've seen the next location. I always get a strange feeling near the end of a hunt. Like an itch on the end of my nose. I feel like we're close. You sound surprised. I am. After all this time. A part of me had already accepted that I'd never find him. That I'd be stuck wandering like this forever. I'll admit, I didn't believe you at first. Still didn't until now. What changed? I haven't spent this much time around anyone since the long hunts in Nasatok. 
but I've gotten to know you, seen how you deal with Kith. Whatever else you turn out to be when we find Theos, you're honest. I know you wouldn't lead me astray in this. What I mean is, thanks. No one's done this much for me in a long, very long time. It feels almost like I'm part of a village again. Uh, what will you do after this is over? Good question. It's funny what you recall after being away for so long. I remember the shape of my hunting trails more clearly than the faces of Kalu or, and our children. I thought that was just what it meant to take care of them, spending nights camped out on the caribou routes instead of at our hearth. But thinking about Persak and how he lived, I'm not so sure. And perhaps that's why the gods gave me the little tooth, to help me see it. She thumbs the Audra wall with the heel of her hand. But I'm getting ahead of myself. First, we've got to find Persak, as well as your query, Clarence Wong. Should we give should give me time to figure out what I'll say to him. What do you think you'll tell Persak? I guess that depends on who he is now. I'd like to think that traveling for five years entitles me to give him a solid earful about all of it. But what really matters to someone in Persak's position? The village he left behind? The family he likely won't remember? If I had accomplished as much as Persak, I'd want to hear about it. I hadn't thought of it that way. Who knows? When we find Theos, maybe you'll get your wish. Onward. Hey. Lights and beetles. And another caster. So this time I have the back rank. Target the caster. Put a wounding shot in there. There's some missiles. Yet more missiles. Okay, cash is dealt with. Ravius is... Okay, he's dominated. Yay. Okay, only for four more seconds. Okay, back rank. Focus this earth blight. Ready with you. Get him. You should have run. here, you back with us. Good. Kill that. And I use your self heal. We got you back. Kill that. I do want to check the progress on Hiravius' weapon. Okay, seven more general kills with it. Hey. Ooh, buddy. Cross this. No, we need to find a crossing. We can't just wade. Oh my, what a bridge. <laughs> All right. Focus the greater wind lights until anything else appears. Okay, this one seems to just be the lights, which ain't too bad. Focus fire, some flanks in there. There we go. All right, then.
Hey. Forest crew. Go to Beatles. But no casters, so I'm okay with that. Okay, Zawa is stuck. Keep on slugging on, folks. crafting machines. Going to inspect the uh, northwest before we head over that bridge because that bridge be progression. If I remember correctly. Focus the Audrigan. Okay, then go below the wisp. And then finally this frame light. Okay, somebody just leveled. And that's Zawa, who's now a level 12 monk. Let's see what skills he's going to get. Stealth. And then for talent. Utility. I just roll the d10. Nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Oh! Wait a minute. He's never had anything. So he has way more than nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, we're with the D twelve instead. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Heart of the storm. Him and a dare got heart of the storm. Okay, we can cross that little brook. Okay, and let's cross this bridge to the northwest. See what's there, and then take the bridge to the southwest. Stalgar. So, Dying Monk. The man on the ground gasps for air, clutching his chest as he struggles. On closer examination, you see his blood-red cloak obscures the full extent of his injuries. His face whitens as blood pulls around him. Please, Traveler. He reaches out. Audrously extending his hand to you. Leave him. Wait, where? 
He clutches his chest, blood oozing from the wound beneath his fingers. Where are you going? Please, I need your help. The slutter must. Blood erupts from the man's mouth, his body twitching as he drowns in his own humors. Moments later, his lifeless, his lifeless form is silent and still. Oh, wow. Task failed the seal missive. So he does not even... You don't even know about the missive. Okay. Again, something I would have... An outcome I never would have encountered had I not uh, been using the dice. Anyone suspected of treachery must be reported at once. Good, you have come. You have heard of the recent defections from our order caused by this... this apostate in Kratum. An answer floats to the surface of consciousness, remembered from ages ago. Yes, I have. This is a dangerous woman whose lies spread like plague. She inspires chaos, sows conflict. Because of these unusual circumstances, I am speaking to all our initiates personally to ensure there is no more dissension. You mean because she was one of us? Who she was no longer matters. If her following continues to grow, there will be war, and all our work will be undone. You were recruited from Kratum, were you not? You must have known this heretic woman, Yavara. I was in love with her. I see. And did she return the sentiment? No. People such as this woman, they carry little room in their hearts for anything but their own delusions. I trust that you will not let these old feelings cloud your judgment. I am trusting you to remain loyal to the gods in this. If you do not, you will have greater powers than me to answer to. But you will answer to me as well. I understand your eminence. Hey. Alrighty, and with that we should be free to go on to... I believe Twin Elms should open up. Yep, Heart Song. Estramor, still. Tread carefully, Estramor. The warrior saunters over, a sneer of suspicion visible beneath streaks of paint. He glances at your gear before favoring you with a long look. Another fugitive from the burning city. The six tribes of Eglon Foth welcome you to Twin Elms. Before you lies the Hearthsong district, you are free to explore it. But do not let your feet stray into the other districts. Those are forbidden to Estramor. What can you tell me about the Twin Elms? The city is sacred to all Glanfathans, as it is a place where our, our ancestors first encountered the Builders. That fated meeting turned our people from generations of wandering to a permanent home among the Builders' relics. When the Builders commanded us to settle here, they allowed us the unique privilege to live among their structures here. It is the only place in Air Glanfath where this is permitted. The sacred city is divided into four districts, Hearthsong, the common district, Old Song, the site of our temples, Elm's Reach, home of Delgem and Druids, and the Burial Isle, which is our most sacred place in the city. I'd like to hear about Hearthsong. This is Hearthsong. It's a place where Glanfathans and Estramor may gather together. It is also the site of the Pastor of the Six, where our tribal leaders, the An Anmafada, meet. He points to a large round building at the other end of the district. That way is the market. Guard your purse there. Norm 
bargains like your grandfather. And if you need a place to stay, follow your fi follow the fence to the east. There you will find the way to the celestial sapling. What which temples lie in Old Song? There is no noon frost, which is dedicated to Rimmergond. A group of pale elves from the frozen Southlands arrived not long ago to oversee it. There is also the Nest, a temple of Hylia, and Galloway's Maw, a den of beasts dedicated to the hunter god. The route to the barrier isle also lies that way. Tell me about Elm's Reach. There lies Terra Evron, one of the only towers the builders still well, one of the only towers of the builders still in perfect condition. Two great elm trees twine around it. Even the mightiest works of the gods protect the works of the builders. Two Adelgium sisters dwell there now. The Hall of Warriors stands at the other end of the district. Rumor has it Anam Foth Simic of the Three Tusks Stelger is there now. Ellsbridge is also where the Druids keep their halls. They are the Ovates of the Golden Grove and the Ethel Knock of Blood Sands. Many shudder at the brutal sacrifices of the of Ethic Knoll, but High Ovate Arona is just as powerful in her own way. My watcher friend, Herogis pipes up from behind you. I would be honored to accompany you to Elm's Reach to meet the, those druids, though I'm a bit wary of any circle with a re reputation for brutal sacrifices. Do you know anything about the burial isle? It is the place where our Amon father are laid to rest among stones placed by the builders. They say the souls of some of the Amon father linger there still. The way lies through Old Song. It is the holiest place in all of Twin Elms. That is all I wanted to know about the city. Uh, something else you wish to hear? Who are the builders? You know them as Ingwithans. To us, they are the builders, creators of the sacred places that we guard to this day. Why is it forbidden to enter the remaining districts of Twin Elms? Twin Elms is a sacred city, built where the first keepers of the stone met the builders. It exists alongside the works of the builders, and it is the only place in all of Eirglanfoth where it is permitted to set foot among these sacred places. The Estremorn, however, do not have the proper respect for the stones here. His words trigger something in your memory. You see an image of a perfect cube of Adra. Just as quickly, the image fades. A leader of one of the tribes could give you permission. Give you the permission of the city. Only Amenfath Bethwill is present in the past of the Sixty Day, and she has her own troubles. I'll keep your words in mind. Best that you keep your visit brief. Word has reached our ears that the riots have ended and the gates of the France Bay have opened once more. Hey. So, this is Twin Elves, home to the six tribes of Air Glanfoth, and some very good heights from what I hear. Okay. So, yeah, first, what we're going to want to do. Actually, I'm going to check some quests real quick in my journal. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? As a peripatetic loner, I'm not privy to the latest news. But the Hollowborn Children is a tale that has reached even my reclusive ears. Or, rather, ear. I don't know if I ever activated Haravis' uh, character quest. Uh, what do the Glanfather and Druids think of this plight? It's been a long time since I've spoken with my circle. They'd probably tell you what I'd tell you. This plight was most certainly the consequence of someone trespassing into Ngwithin places, not meant for folk. I mean... What else, other than the gods, could inflict punishment of such impressive scale? What are your thoughts on the Hollowborn? Any time a life is separated from its soul. I wanted to pretend it was just a rumor when I first heard of it. In my youth, I'd curse the dear woodens for being ignorant despoilers that breed out of control. But soulless babies? What heartless gods would inflict that kind of tragedy? No parent or child deserves to be a part of that horror. Let's talk of other matters. Something? Uh, tell me about My yourself. My second favorite subject. What would you like to know? Hmm. What's the story behind the symbol of whale on your eye patch? Whale is known 
as the iOS face, so his symbol seemed a good fit for my eye patch. Wild iconography is rather popular in my home tribe, but it seems he's not widely venerated here in the Deerwood. I remember thinking that if I consecrated my eye to he who obfuscates and reveals, then maybe with enough devotion, Wild would make use of the old rune thing. So I think you see me staring at rumps and cleavage. It's really just the will of Wall controlling my gaze. Honest. What's your relationship with Galloway? I was raised as a disciple of the Seeker God. He is a champion of the hunt. But it is the simple struggle for sustenance or the, or the scholarly pursuit of knowledge. In my older years, I found... Life has shown me I am more suited to the ways of Wall. The furious hunt for knowledge often outpaces the journey to real understanding. Uh... Druids are known for changing to animals. What sort of creatures can you become? He takes a half strip step backward as you ask the question. All sorts of things, he says quietly with a long, uncomfortable gaze. Harari stares at you blankly, arms folded. Let's discuss something else. That's an usually terse response from you. What are you holding back? It's a long story, and... And I haven't really told it before to an outsider, so bear with me. I struggled with spirit shifting, the final rite of passage in my druidic training. I prayed to Galloway for insight and, in the style of seekers of old, went to the forest, alone, to ask for guidance. Then I got my answer, an answer at least, in the form of a vibrantly colored Stelgar that pounced from the underbrush and made a salient demonstration of its capacity to eat things one-fifteenth its size. You're alive today, so how did you fend off the beast? Fend it off? I ripped off its arm and sent it running. As the beast was lopping off bits of my handsomeness, I remember trying to fight back, swinging with arms too short to reach. I felt I had the energy for one last swipe at the beast's nose. And when I lashed out with a punch, my arm fell twice as massive, and my fingers sprouted talons! In a rush of power, I shifted into a mirror of my assailant. Apparently, he couldn't pick on someone his own size. By the battle's end, his severed arm was in my maw. The beast limped away in defeat. That's quite an impressive tale. I thought learning to spirit shift would win me some respect. Maybe trap myself in a deer and lass with a lust for little men. Alas, I might have been better off staying out of novice. When I wandered back to my village, they saw my wounds and asked what happened. I showed them. The name they called my form was the Autumn Stelgar, and they were not impressed. The Viao of my circle believed the Autumn Stelgar to be a heinous abomination. It is said that if it eats you, your soul is invariably lost. As this was my first and most intuitive form, they deemed me a carrier of its evil. Even though I never so much as threatened my kin, I was ruled unfit and cast out. I don't know what message Galarian was trying to send. The only lesson I learned was that the Seeker God will punish you for seeking. Can you learn to spirit shift into something less terrifying? I already can and sometimes do. But the druids my circle assign great meaning to one's first form. I'll always be unclean to them. Or at least recognized as a proper druid. No, but I know I passed an initiation right five times more perilous than any of those kin betrayers that it insisted I was a failure. So you're some sort of soul cannibal? No. At least I think not. I've never actually sat down and eaten an entire person to find out. I'm not that curious to find out. You didn't choose your shape-shifting form? No. It chose me. Or so I imagine. I always assumed I was sh shifted into a stout, something more true to my nature. As the obscured teachers, when the answer is inscrutable, one must be content to ponder the question. Thank you for sharing your story. Well, if you don't know me, you can't trust me. And if you can't trust me, odds are low you'll leap in front of a flying arrow to save my life. I've been meaning to visit the druids of Twin Elms to see if they know more about my spirit shift. If our journey takes us there... Perhaps they can enlighten me with more information about the Autumn Stelgar. But for now, maybe we can talk about something less depressing? On second thought, some other time. Your loss. Okay. Hey. So that gets us that quest. Alright, 
then. So let's talk to the chieftain here, the Amphatha, to uh, get access to the rest of the city. Another Estramore. What do you want? A middle-aged Orlin woman stands at the back of the longhouse, an expression of irritation on her narrow features. As you approach, she takes a decisive step towards you. Sagani leans in, careful. This woman's young for an elder, and looking to prove herself, I think. I'm looking for another who passed through the city. You Estramoran are given the freedom of our sacred city. That you ask for this person is suspicious. There are reasons we don't let you Estramoran roam our sacred city. Reasons I am coming to understand. You're having some kind of trouble. Maybe I could help. I'm afraid not. Looters have grown bolder at the sites of the builders. The people of Defiance Bay set fire to their own city. And every week, the three Tusk Stelgar bring news of more desperate settlers pushing at our borders, trying to escape their plague of an old fame children. Suddenly you fear the presence of someone else in the hall. The Amenfath continues to glare at you, but something has stepped out of her skin. It reaches out to you. Permitting more strangers the freedom of the city is out of the question right now. Go and be thankful that Anamfath Shimak doesn't sit in the passage of the Six today. He would not be so kind as I. A vision of an Orlan man appears near Bethel. He has the same green-brown fur and hazel eyes as she does. Help me reason with them, he points behind you. Turning, you see the ghostly shapes of five other... Amen, father. Another Orlin with tarny fur and a scar scarred face, a frowning dwarf, a blackford Orlin, and two elves. You're angry about something. I hear it in your voice. What is it? Are the outrages I list for you not enough? Trouble brews, and nothing of it is my choosing. The spectral Orlin takes another step from her, setting his foot down with a slow, heavy motion, tendrils of essence strain between them, and he grimaces and leans forward, as if struggling against a gale. The angry Amenfath winces. War. The spectral Orlin's voice is a rasping croak. They're headed for war. Remind them of Fivrilt's warning. Does Fivrilt's warning mean anything to you? Fivrilt's so image gasps. Taut threads of essence tug at him, drawing him back into the Amenfoth. He looks up at you again. I tried to tell them. The build souls have touched even the Estramorn. You'd better explain yourself. Uh, the build souls have touched even the Estramorn? There's no way you could have known this saying. Not unless you are a galoose on Anums, a watcher of souls. Yes, I'm a watcher. That explains much. Feralt's warning came before the Broken Stone War. Feralt, my ancestor on my mother's side, was Anamfoth of our tribe then. When the Estramoric farmers defiled the Builder's monuments, Feralt urged the other Anamfotha to patience. But louder, angrier voices prevailed. Feralt believed that the invaders could be taught to respect the Builders as we do. He also believed the Builders' souls had spread to all peoples, and that we should avoid needless conflict with others. More practically, he worried that a violent response would only spur further bloodshed across the generations, and you can see where we are today. Perhaps the problem is that you weren't firm enough. If you can say that, then you know nothing of the violence we levied against the colonists. We were merciless, and the generations have remembered. While Feralt's words were shrewd, they were ignored back then. Simply remembering his warning now will not undo the wars and the changes that the years have seen. There is blood on these stones, and that is all anyone remembers now. 
An image of a polished Ardra cube flashes into your mind. There is writing on the sides, but the image is too faint for you to read it. The Froth turns away from you and looks at the ground, gnawing a pointed claw. You can't change the past, but your choices now still matter. Yes, that is the problem. Another Estramor came through here a few days ago, and, well, letting him through was a mistake. One I am eager not to repeat. The Guided Compass tribe has a reputation for being too soft with Estramorin. One that will not be improved by my failure to stop this man, who has desecrated our most sacred sites. I won't that sounds like the man I came here to stop. To correct it. We bar twin elms from Estramorin to protect the ancient places that the builders left behind. The builders left this heritage to us to defend, but they alone had access to it. On this much, at least the six tribes agree. You see, again, the polished Ardra cornerstone in your mind. This time, the image is clearer. Each f phrase, face of the stone is inscribed with a phrase you know by heart. You feel your lips form the words. The gift from the builders of civilization to the guardians of their legacy. May the guardians watch the door while the builders keep the key. These were the words given to the keepers of the stone. I know. Very well. The city is yours to explore. Tell the guard at the gate that you come to see the cornerstone with the blessing of the guided compass. If the gods have truly returned one of the builders to us, find the Delamgon of Ter Evron in Elm's Reach. If the gods have sent you here with a purpose, the Delamgon will know. Farewell. What brings you here? Sensing your approach, an agitated elven hunter suddenly drops his conversation and turns to face you. What kind of courtesy have you learned in your filthy homeland? A red stripe of paint gleams, pearly with sweat, from cheekbone to cheekbone. We speak of them father matters. Be gone. The huntress in the group raises her calloused hand. Still your heart, red eye. Do not forget where you stand. She parts the fine strands of golden hair that fell before her face and acknowledge you with a nod. In the house of our ancestors and the six tribes, we commune as one people. Red Eye looks away and fumes in her strained breath. The ancestors will forgive me and my brother when I clean the shame away from his name. He looks at the huntress and for the taint it has brought to our tribe. What happened to your brother? My brother, the hunter's heavy breath pauses for a moment. My brother Firam is the greatest hunter of our tribe. He set out on a blood hunt but hasn't returned. And now, Anthrith, that puny liar, he claims that my brother. The elven huntress fills in the silence. Arthwin belongs to another tribe. He is the hunter that competed against Firam during their blood hunt. She gives a glancing look at Riedai. Arthwin claims that Firam has exiled himself, deciding to not return to Twin Elms. Riedai scowls. A stripe of paint curves like an angry wound, exiled in shame, for losing to him during the blood hunt. Can you believe this? Liar! Even though Othran returned with the giant Stalgar's finger as proof, it's hard to believe that Fian would have failed to kill the prey first. The huntress digs her heel on the dark soil, but you cannot claim that yet, Redai, not until the An father judge the truth. Othran's weak from a lower tribe. He lies. I'll find the truth and clean my brother's name. Uh, why would Ar Arthwin lie about your brother? Why? Red Eye, please, stole your anger. He does not know our customs. The hunter turns to your nods. Arthwin stands much to gain from claiming a victory over Firam. It brings renown and glory to his kin, a lesser tribe, the Twice Blood Arrows. Arthwin has no history, no name, and now he returns a hero while well, my brother tricked, perhaps worse. You mentioned a blood hunt. What is it? We prove our worth in a blood hunt. We set up to stalk and prey, always a dangerous creature. And only one kills it first. The elven huntress interrupts with an exasperated sigh. Yes, but we hunt as pairs, to bond as clan father and as one, not as enemies. Two hunters, two tribes, one spirit. 
That is our way. Our way isn't to lie. We don't betray our brothers and sisters for our own gain. The blood hunt between your brother and Arthwin was has broken the communion of our tribes, or I. Do not dig in this wound until you can claim the truth. Perhaps our customs appear strange to you, but despite what you now see, the grandfathers hold our bond sacred. How do you plan to kill Firam's name? A bead of sweat rolls down Radai's forehead and hangs on his red-painted cheekbone like a drop of blood. It quivers as the hunter's muscles twitch. I can't tarry here while my brother's fate remains unknown. The Amenfath must let me go. To judge Arthan and to clean our tribe's name, they cannot listen only to your truth. The huntress lowers her head, glancing at you. Before the Amenfath, only an impartial voice can speak of what happened. Redai whips his neck, and the drop of sweat lingering on his cheekbone flies in your direction. You mean to involve this one in Estramore? She points at him, her calloused fingers curved like a claw. Listen to me now. Arthur returned. What the proof? Your brother did not even come back. The huntress blows against the fine, blows against the fine hairs floating down over her face. The tribes are split. Something must be done. And this one is known to speak the truth. As an Estramore, I can look into this without risking tension between your tribes. Radai turns to face you. His hard features betray your emotional knots. You're right in claiming this. The own father would agree to listen. There's no union between you and our tribes. The huntress nods at you. Fearm and Arthur went to the North Beald Forest, beyond the Old Song Pass, to hunt a giant Stelgar. Search there and return to us with the truth of you can, but be aware. Stelgar are such size and many times over their less akin. You should gather a big pride that follows them closely. Red Eye fixes his eyes on you, two glowing embers of the blood-red stripe painted across his face. Estramor, I didn't expect help. But I'll do anything to know my brother's fate and to clear the stain that Arthur has spilled on our tribe. He throws his chin back. Anything. This I claim. Hey. Okay, so we have a few different... Uh, Quests to follow up on here. For now, I'm going to focus uh, more on some of our uh, companion quests. So that Northworld Forest, that is where we will um, complete Zagani's. I am going to go to the Elm's Reach District. Because uh, that will help us with uh, Heravius's questline. The guard places his spear between you and the path that leads beyond the gates. Still, Estramore, the rest of the city is forbidden, except by order of one of the Um Fatha. Trespassing in Twin Elms is punishable by death. I come to see, th see the cornerstone with the blessing of the guided compass. The guard scowls and looks at his, as his companions who nod back. He turns to you again, his knuckles whitening around the shaft of his spear. Always oh, too cozy with the Estramore. Go, then, and mind your step around the sacred stones. Come on, load. There we go. So first, I believe we go to the Blood Sands, which is where Heravius can find his answer. But first, we must cross this bridge. You have stayed true to our cause, Inquisitor, when so many others have not. For every heretic we confess, for every betrayer that burns on our pyres, new sheep continue to flock to Ivara Ixensios. But not you. I underestimated you in the beginning, but no longer. You honor me, Grand Inquisitor. It is not for honor that I summoned you today, but for duty. Too many of our own have confessed upon the wheel and the rack and the flame. Too many of our faithful have had their minds poisoned by the Kratom Witch. The tide is against us now. We have but one option. 
Yavara's following must see her exposed for what she is. She must confess her heresy before my court. How would we reach her? Not in Kratom, surely. Their lord has embraced her heathen faith and protects her with his army. But in Osionis, things would be different. The king of Osionis is a sinful man. We have helped him to see the error of his ways, and now he fears for his soul. He would pay any price for absolution. But how would we get Eovara to move to Oceanus? You have already done much for the Inquisition. I wouldn't ask this were there any other choice. Hey. Two identical women seem to fade into view as they move away from the great trees that camouflage them. Their skin is tree bark, rigid and scaly, wreathed in a curling tangle of roots, buds, and blossoms. Their hair hangs beneath a shade of serrated leaves, like the drooping branches of the elms above. And the pupils of their eyes are encircled by hundreds or even thousands of concentric rings, as if to mark the accumulated wisdom of millennia. Turn around, flesh creature. Outsiders are not permitted to approach the elms. Do you not feel it, sister? Something familiar? An ancient soul, like the other one. Another defiler, no doubt. Let us fell him and be troubled no more. It would pay the debt of his predecessor. Hmm, so it would seem, Rhiannon. But we must not hasten to judgment. I see a different motive here. Different questions in these eyes. What of it, young trespasser? Is it as my sister says? Or are you here to stain this place with foul deeds? I'd gladly burn this place down, but I have more pressing concerns. Did I not tell you it was so, sister? We do the land of misdeed by not cutting this one down before we can join the other defiler. The diseased tree bodes ill for the grove. Lacking in sense though he may be, we both know that he is here to find the man Theos Exarchanon. Nothing more. Really, sister? And you wonder why your leaves begin to fall out before midsummer? Clearly that man did not want to be followed. Whatever the relationship here, I suspect it is anything but cordial. The answer is yes, old one. We crossed paths with Theos not long ago, and we can tell you where he went. But I find it curious that anyone would seek him out. Suspicious, even. If we are to help you find him, we would know why. He crossed me. I intend to get my revenge. I like him better now, Shiva. Indeed. A kindred spirit, it seems. But that's what this is really about, isn't it? You are tied to him. I see it now. You are awakened. Your soul is awake and something once very deep now wells to the surface. Past overwhelms present, closes in around you. Your time has nearly reached its end. I just need to get to Theos. I'm sorry to tell you this, but Theos cannot give you what you seek. Nor can any man. An awakening cannot be undone any more than your past can be undone. What does she mean? I thought Mere World said. What? But that can't be right. Not after everything. There must be someone else we can ask. I'm sorry. So this has all been for nothing. I'm go and I'm going to lose my mind. The soul is formless without a past to shape it. Did you truly expect to be able to wipe it away? I had to believe in something. You would rather believe in a comforting falsity than accept a hard truth. A common trait among your kind. Endearing in some ways, but it is an obstruction. A lie within a lie. It is only when you face that truth, abandon hope of salvation, and digest its uncompromising absoluteness, that a soul's true nature is laid bare. However, as much as my sister speaks truly that there is no way back from an awakening, there may yet be a way forward. Would you agree, Shiva? I would were the way not so likely to end in death. 
You underestimate me. Or perhaps you underestimate your foe, old one. Where your soul is renewed in its ignorance in each span of your life, his only grows in cunning and resolve. The man Theos you must already know by now. You are linked by a common past. Something about it lingers within you, festering, unresolved. What it is I cannot see any more than you. And without that knowledge, your doom is certain. But were you to learn the source of this discord, perhaps it could be put to rest. Though it is equally possible it will trouble you as much now as it did then. And merely speed your condition to its end. My past comes to me in pieces. How do I, I unlock the rest? You might wait for it to come on its own, of course. But when it comes, it will replace your sanity's last breath. Such is the nature of your condition. Or you could learn it from someone who already knows. Theos, would he remember? It is said the gods made his memory perfect. That he may never forget his charge. If he ever knew, he still does. Not that he would tell you, of course. You have followed the right person for the wrong reason, it seems. We see it often beneath the elms. The soul dragging mind and body to unknown places for unfathomable reasons. You may have wandered into Theos's path many times, in many lifetimes, without an awakening to show you why. The only thing that's certain is you did not find what you sought. You said you know where he went. He has gone down beneath the tower to a place older than we, where the people of Engwith once walked. He makes his way to the buried city, Sun and Shadow. May he stay down there and rot with the remains of his people. He may yet. He won't be returning the way he came, that much is certain. He opened a secret path in the tower's base and saw it destroyed behind him through some vile means. Is there another way to get to him? We know of one. On the burial aisle, through the court of the penitents, Brayeth Yamin. A shortcut, in fact. Don't be cruel, sister. The way my sister speaks of is not for the faint of heart. A great pit at the center of a forgotten court, where faiths were judged in place of crimes. To most, it is simply a gateway to death. With the help of the gods, it can take you where you want to go. I have to jump into a pit. Is this some kind of trick? Oh, sister! If only we'd thought to trick Theos into jumping! No trick, I'm afraid. Though without the proper preparations, the fall will certainly kill you. The pit is said to have been a means of judgment by the gods. Those cast into it are meant to die. It is that way you must pass to reach Sun and Shadow. The court is old. We do not know much for certain, but it would seem only the gods themselves can grant passage. What is this court? No more than a ruin now. It is older than we, a place for the trial of heretics. We were not here to witness it, but at one time there was a group that refused to acknowledge the gods. Neither the first nor the last, of course, but these were numerous and all put on trial for it. Those who did not repent were cast into the pit and imprisoned below. The fall killed them, of course. The prison was not for people, but for their souls, and their sentences were eternal. It is said that many of the condemned repented and were permitted by the gods to ascend from the pit, so long as they pledged their service to one of them. But these are old legends. How would I ever get the gods to help me? Behind us is Ter Evron, said to pierce the shroud itself and a place of communion with all gods. If ever there was a time for prayer, you have found it. So the only way to get through this pit is to pray for help? Not the only way. Just the only one that doesn't end with your body impaled on jagged rocks. Who would I pray to? Any god you can, I should think. I would pray first to those gods you like best. I hope for your sake the feeling is shared. Is there no other way? None. How do I pray? Air Evron is also called the Hall of Stars, and the stars show us the allegiances of the gods. When stars are in conjunction, 
We know the gods they represent are aligned as well. You should choose a place to pray where you'll be closest to those you want to hear you. If a god stands alone, you should pray to that god. If they band together, you should address them all. Choose your words wisely, for all gods expect proper homage, and none has patience for fools. I had other questions. What do you wish to know? Uh, how did you know I was pursuing Theos? The same way that you are no doubt able to peer into the ether and experience the souls of others. It is something we are born with, some more, some less. A gift common to many creatures of the wilds. You share certain similarities with the man you pursue. For your sake, I pray they are few and of no consequence. You mentioned that people come to these elms without knowing why. A soul has a will all its own. Its needs and whims are seldom understood, but they follow them all the same. There is something about this place that reaches beyond our understanding. Something like a beacon. The elms have a way of uniting souls that have been seeking one another, with or without their owner's awareness. Sometimes it is for love, sometimes for vengeance, sometimes for peace. Often it is for no reason we will ever know. In your case, let us hope it is for peace. Or vengeance. I wanted to know about the two of you. There is little to be said about us, for we are bound here. Caretakers and defenders of this place. Our journey has been over time, but not distance. Measured in observations, but not experiences. We have seen the elms grow tall. We have seen cities built, burned, and built again. The only constant has been the tower. A silent companion through the ages. You can imagine why this recent destruction has stirred my sister so. If you do nothing else, make that man pay for what he did here. I need to know about praying for the support of the gods. We will tell okay, you what that we just can. takes me back here. Farewell. Before you go, tell me this, old one. I'm curious. If you were to subdue your enemy, what would you do with him? What would give you peace? I wish to undo the harm he's caused. You would need to have twice as many lifetimes as he to repair his savage work. But perhaps there are strides you can make. All the same, think on this matter. Be assured in your course. In the end, it may mean all the difference, not just to his soul, but to yours. And be warned. Some questions have answers that can never be learned. And it is those that trouble the soul above all others. May you find an answer to yours. Hey. Okay, so before I actually go into the blood sands to continue her obviouses, I will um, pick up the quests here in Ter Evron. So there's going to be uh, four different uh, pedestals of different gods or alliances of gods, which in turn give you some different quests and you have to complete at least one of them to uh, get a blessing to uh, go into act four. Uh, you can complete all of them and I do intend to just because you know experience items all that stuff. Okay we have a quest Saint Ifen's Knot. The Imran legend holds that St. Ifing created a miraculous knot that Faithless could not untie. A daring burglary recently cleaned out the mirrored precious relics in the Smith's Hall of Yimgel, where each treasure once stood, a string was tied, each leading back to the intricate knot in the center of the temple. The burglar left a tantalizing clue in the form of a winter written prayer to St. Ifing, but the riddle has stumped the locals. Desperate to recover their artifacts, the priests have reached out to mercenaries and adventurers for help. Hmm, we'll send, uh, Aloth. He's my go-to guy. Okay, Luminous Ardra Shard. Crisp flashes of light run through this Ardra Shard, pulsing in his faceted core like veins of light fueled by a heart of fire. Hey. Scattered and charred stones block the passage into sun and shadow.
fine contraption that I would dearly love to inspect. Okay, so this is the Alliance of Remigard, Skane, and Undra. In the nearby constellation, you can make out the shape of a strange horned beast. From time to time, you think you sense a faint chill emanating from the shrine, shrine itself. Pray to Remigand. You kneel before the shrine and prepare to recite the ritual words. All life ends in stillness. You feel a sudden gust of cold air, as if the shrine were bursting into wintry life. The frigid wind cuts through you like a sharpened blade, and darkness encroaches upon the edges of your sight. You kneel and close your eyes. As you pray, the blackness fades to white, and a howling wind fills your ears. The vision that slowly resolves itself is of a broad, frozen plain. You see a procession of elves in the distance, periodically fading into and emerging from the whiteness. They trudge over snowbanks, into their heads down against the drifting winds. I know this place. This is the white that wends. As you trek past, as they trek past you, one man buttled in furs turns his head. You head, you headed for noon frost in the frost hoon breach too. Before you can answer, he's slumbered ahead. You follow the caravan. In a couple of minutes, you come to a wall of ice. It disappears into the pale emptiness overhead and stretches as far as you can see in either direction. The elves stop in front of a mirror smooth section that's framed like a temple door. It seems somehow thinner than the rest of the wall. You can't see what's on the other side, but a debilitating cold emanates from within. The elves pull pickaxes and shovels from their sealskin packs and begin hacking at the smooth ice, their implements flying through the air in swift, swift shining arcs. Though they throw their bodies into the labor, not one of them so much as scratches the polished ice. Yet with each blow, something bellows in the distance. Whatever that is, it's huge and angry. Sagani so squirts into the whiteout and is coming our way. Adair calls out to the elves, Hey, you might want to hold off on that. But that howling wind seems to swallow up his voice. The elves hack away, seemingly oblivious to the furious lowing into the tremors under their feet. The snow has risen to your knees. Your legs feel frozen in the drifts. Try to get the elves attention. You grab the nearest elf by her shoulder, shaking her and yelling over the howling winds. You point in the direction of the booming noise, but she only scowls. Leave us, traveler. We've got to get through. We can't stay on the side any longer. But you haven't even shipped the ice. I know. That's why we've got to keep working. Attack the elves. You strike the nearest elf, and he crumbles into a mound of snow. You attack another, and she falls just as easily. While you cut down the elves around you, their fellows continue cleaving at the ice, working faster. Even the word doubled efforts seem futile. When the last of the elves falls, the bellowing finally ceases and the wind dies down. A final gale blows past, scattering the remains of the elves in a chaotic flurry. You notice a single spiderweb crack in the smooth barrier. Is the only thing that mars the perfect surface of the ice. Whatever on the other side of the strange doorway, you feel it tugging at you. Only when you look back and see the parallel gashes trailing behind your legs in the snow do you realize how strong its pull is. My end comes to all things in time. Seal the frost human breach and instruct the pilgrims in the patience of Remergond. Plug the hole with a handful of snow. You fill your hand with snow and shove it into the crack. It hardens instantly, and a hoary rhyme grows over the smooth surface of the frozen doorway, fusing it with the rest of the wall. When you take your hand away, a perfect crystal of ice remains in your palm. As you examine the crystal, the vision around you fades, but the end melting a shot of ice remains in your hand. So that is a quest in Rimmergod's temple. In the glittering stars of the nearby constellation, you see the grim shape of a skull. Its jaws are open wide, as if frozen in a silent scream. Pray to Bareth. There is life and death, and death and life. There is a rippling shift in the air around you, as if some unfelt wind has changed, bringing unexpected warmth. You feel the peculiar weight of an unseen presence and of eyes upon you. 
You kneel and pray to Barith. Even while your eyes are closed, you see a road that seems to stretch on forever. The stars wheel overhead in a clockwork rotation of constellations, disappearing over the horizon to your left only to rise on your right. You try to make out the details on either side of the road, but your eyes can't seem to focus. One moment you think you'll see a meadow blanketed with mist and another sheer canyon walls. For just an instant, you even see waves lapping at the edges of the road. Were you to step into the shifting landscape, you feel certain you would only end up back on the road. You know this is a vision, but the patched dirt feels firm beneath your feet and the night air cool on your face. You are walking. Your feet seem to carry you forward on their own accord. Something moves ahead of you, and as you get closer, you see two stone figures that look strangely familiar. Our old friends, life and death and death and life, were in the realm of the twin god, and here are its two aspects. You remember the door to Cleb and Relog, as the two figures carved in the mountain next to it. One looks vaguely male and the other vaguely female. Only a thin layer of flesh covers their skeletal bodies, which twist to face the doorway between them. The doorway, however, is not what you saw in the ruins. It is a skull, gaping and jawless, and as you look on, its open mouth seems to grow. The arms of the two stone sculptures are switched towards the mountain, inviting you in. Enter the skull's mouth. The road continues through the maw to another shifting landscape surrounded by stars. As you pass through it, you see an identical doorway in the distance. A dwarven man stands near it, unmoving. You turn around and look behind you, only to see the skull gate you just passed facing you. An elven woman waits in the road. Like the dwarf, she stands still. Approach the dwarven man. You continue down the road toward him. You look up as you approach, but you can't tell if he's looking at you or through you. His face, his face is smooth but placid, as if the flesh is detached from his muscles underneath. As you look on, his face begins to change. Wrinkles crack at the corners of his eyes. His mouth sinks, carving deep lines from his nose to the corners of his lips. His jowls sag, and the loose flesh hangs like dough. He raises his cupped hands. They're covered in blood. He lifts them to, face, to his face and smears himself from his newly creased forehead to the wattles of his neck. As he massages the dark, sticky food into his skin, the fresh wrinkles disappear, the hanging folds recede, and his flesh tightens as if it were adhering to his skull. He lifts his head, and this time you know he's looking at you. His renewed face looks like a mask, artificially smooth and still. Behind it, his black eyes are two hungry pits, yawning like the cold, empty mouths of skulls. Come, make your sacrifice to Ethel his body blocks the path. He extends a bloody hand towards you. Attack him. You strike out and are surprised at how easily his flesh gives beneath your blow. It rips like dried canvas, following a large seam that begins at his arm and stretches the length of his body. Blood gushes forth in such quantities that you can't imagine there was ever anything else in him. Sure enough, as the dwarf empties his blood, empties of blood, he collapses like a desiccated husk. The blood is the and the path gleams with a thousand souls' worth of essence. The essence evaporates, trailing shining filaments into the night sky. Only now that he is dead can you continue onward. The blood pools around your feet, and you can look up and see the elven woman waiting further down the road. Approach the elven woman. You start toward her. There's something unnatural about the way she stands. She's too still. When you get closer, you can see that her legs taper into a slender trunk, and in place of her feet are gnarled, twisting roots. She lifts her face to an invisible sun. Her long, golden hair is the color of autumn leaves, and as you look more closely, you realize that her head is actually covered with tendrils and vines, sprouting brilliant yellow leaves. Each glimmers with the essence of an entire soul. She gives you a beatific smile. As you look on, the leaves slowly fall from her head and settle at her roots. They melt into the path beneath her, and almost immediately, new leaves sprout in the place of the old. She reaches towards you, still smiling as roots spring from her fingertips. Her outstretched arms bar the path. Come, graft your soul to the golden grove. Attack her. You swing at her, trying to knock her arm away from you. Yet as the blows connect, you feel her skin grow rigid and cold. Her outstretched arm petrifies, and as a rough stone bark overtakes her flesh, she can only look on in horror. Her feet are rooted in place, but she twists and writhes, 
as of trying to flee her own dying limb. The petrification reaches her shoulder and spreads down her body, freezing it in a painful arc. It creeps up her neck, and she throws her face skyward like a drowning swimmer. The grayness covers her face, freezing her grasp in stone. Now that she is still in lifeless, you can continue past her. Only the golden leaves of her head remain untouched, and as you watch, they fall one by one to the path below. They shrivel at the shimmering essence fades from them. A voice echoes along the road, barely more than a whisper in the breeze. Return them to the wheel. You lift your gaze and see the skull gate ahead of you on the path. The candles of Everon wink through the open mouth. So that is Barith's quest to uh, kill the uh, leaders of the uh, two druid um, circles who are found of forms of immortality. This shrine sits before a bright constellation. Its storms forming the oval shape of an egg. A pair of rings sprout from the egg, stretching out to either side. Pray to Hylia. Live every note of life's song. Your words seem to ring in the air, your voice rendered melodic and lilting by some unseen art. You shut your eyes to pray. As you wait in darkness, the world around you changes. You feel sunlight bright and warm on your face. A light breeze carries music to your ears. As vivid as these sensations feel, you somehow know they are not real. You look around and find yourself standing in an open-air temple built on a mountain a summit. It's filled with elves, orlins, and assorted other kith. Ringing the entire scene is a fringe of trees, the verdant branches filled with birds of all different colors, shapes, and sizes. Everyone is singularly absorbed and particularly pursuit. An orlin sits with a canvas, a paintbrush in hand, and draws of green, blue, and yellow pigments at his feet. An elf and an amara stand standing to the side are locked in conversation, their expressions dancing with delight. Still others scribbled stanzas of poetry or crude sketches on leaves of sheaves of paper, losing themselves in the delicate minutiae of lines and syllables. You feel the breeze again, and two elves base came in the sunlight shiver. Look at this place, all these people, coming together to share the creations and what on earth is that painting supposed to be? The largest group gathers in the middle of the temple. They sing a lush chaotic harmony composed of several complementary melodies. Others drift towards the singers in ones and twos as if buffeted by a gust of wind or a phrase of a song. A ripple passes through the trees. You think it's the wind, but the tripping changes to screeching. Hundreds of birds take the skies, all headed in one direction. Away. Something must be coming. The devotees glance at their trees, just barely distracted from their activities. But the wind picks up, scattering their pages of poetry and art, and ripping the songs from their lips. They look skyward, and you follow their gaze. A dark shape blots out the sun. You can't tell what it is, but it unfolds and expands. It seems to fill the sky. The wind wars over the summit. That explains the birds. Before you can flee, a shadow falls over the temple. It begins as a stain in the corner and spreads, blotting out the flagstones. It reaches the nearest kith, a black furred orlin. The darkness swallows her, leaving only a puff of smoke in her place. The two elves that you saw earlier, a man and a woman, flee. You get a brief image of them from huddled in the shadow of a mountain. They seem to see you too, and then reach out, calling silently at you. after you. The others, however, seem frozen. As the shadow advances, they likewise vanish one by one. The driving gale sh scatters the ashes and the charred remains of their creations. You look up again at the source of the shadow, but the eclipsed sun forms a blinding corona around the thing. You can't make out any details. You can, however, feel heat. Restore my temple. You look down and find yourself standing next to Hylia Shrine in Terra Everon. Your pulse still races and your skin damp with sweat from your strange encounter. Hey. So that is the quest to uh, take care of the Sky Dragon in Hylia's Temple. And here's the uh, Shrine to Abaddon, Galloway, and Margren. Before you get the sh shrines, sits the constellation of a snarling hound, Fangs Bard. Pray to Galloway. Uh, survival begins with strength from within. The air around you stirs, and a gust of wind blows across the back of your neck. 
You catch the faintest smell of wet earth. The scent of sweat, fur, low leaves, the discordant howls. I believe Galloway's herald approaches. Howl back. The beast bays in response, its voice high and clear. The thick undergrowth shivers with movement, and heavy paws pound the wet grass. You're not certain if the creature is hunting or leading you, but you instinctively give chase. As you tumble through dew-speckled bushes and climb brambles, each stride feels longer than the last. You draw long fills of crisp, clean air and feel your energy renewed. The rhythm of your stride and the thumping of your beast's paws drive the blood thrumming into your ears. Th you speed ahead, following the hound's cries, when a split finger pine crashes to the ground in front of you. A massive bear lunges into the gap and roars. It catches sight of you. You turn and race in the opposite direction, leaping over the fallen tree trunk. Pine cones crunch your foot, the bear lumbers after you. Its hot breath washes over the back of your neck, filling your nose with a rank order of slaughter. You see it clinging just past a thicket of broad leaves and sprint toward it. As you break through the foliage, you see a massive Linus curled up in the clan in front of you. With a last burst of energy, you divert your momentum and hurl yourself into the bushes. Any second now, you expect to feel the bear fall upon you, but a furious war on the other side of the clan draws your attention. The bear has stopped at the tree line. It swipes the empty air with claws large enough to rend armor, but it does not advance. The lioness, for her part, twists her body into a tight coil. She growls, her ears pressed against her head. But she makes no move to attack the intruder. That is the third largest bear I've ever seen. What's keeping it from crushing the lioness? There's an unusual stalemate in the air. I can feel that these creatures deeply loathe each other. They both refuse to strike. You back deep into the foliage, keeping your eyes on the two mighty predators. As you crawl backwards, the heel of your hand brushes something furred. A warm sigh grazes your cheek. You freeze in place, slowly turning your head to see what waits behind you. Two amber eyes shine in the darkness. Oop, sorry. Holy hound himself! Her obvious yelps in bewilderment. It's not just his herald, it's the lord of the hunt here! The Orlon jumps to one knee as his hands dart about his pockets and snatch the rusted hound's head icon buried within. The eyes meet your gaze, briefly, then turn to the standoff in the clean. The hound behind you yawns, fangs flashing. When you turn back, the lion and bear have disappeared. In their place is a stone wolf's maw, gapping wide enough to swallow you whole. Beyond it is an outline of a temple, towering but indistinct. Blood must feed the wall, maw ma watcher. See that a true champion reigns. Turn back to Ter Evron. And that is the quest to resolve the situation of stalemate in Galloway's Temple. So we have to uh, complete at least one of those quests. Uh, we will be doing all four of them. Because, you know, why not? Uh, now, we will head to the Blood Sands, where technically we could kill oh, the uh, one of the knew that was bad. druids we need to. And the only way to complete that quest is to kill him. There is no way to get him to uh, stand down. But before we do that, we will just... We'll do that later for now we're just going to explore because i think this might be a few things here that once you kill him basically in the entire place goes hostile and there might be one or two things we actually need to uh gather from here a dwarven man stands motionless near the boring fire that lights the cavern your sacrifice feeds the land supplicants come forth a gust of smoke curls around him licking the charred flesh that bulges on his forearm. They suddenly flex Estramor. The dwarf holds his fist in a tight grip. Your kin doesn't come here to share with the tribes. What do you want? What's this place? Blood Sands. The dwarf picks on his scarred forearm. His guttural sigh mingles with the crackling of wood and buds behind him. As I said, Estramorn really visit our halls. The Glen Fathers call this place Blood Sands. We call it home. The ethic null has tendered the land within the cave since before the arrival of the tribes to two to twin elms. Be warned, Estramor, we bleed life to nurture it. The sacrifices 
Our sacrifices may strike you as savage, but the health of these lands depends on them, and it is unseemly for guests to insult their hosts. Tell me about the sacrifices. Everything must die to return a new Estramor. Through the sacrificial rites, we offer supplicants the honor of giving their most precious gift back to their brethren, back to the land. The blood gives us strength. Even the Glanfathans have come to depend on the blood paint. They brim with power before battle, all thanks to the sacrifices of their kin. Goodbye. Remember, Estramor, you are a guest in these halls. Respect our ways and will tolerate your presence among us. Essence taken by force may sustain one, but essence given freely empowers many. Not gonna steal anything. Head down here. Because I believe this is also where we uh, find someone who can give info to Heravius. Estramore. Welcome to the Blood Sands. It is rare that an Estramor sets foot in these caverns. What brings you here, I wonder? What do you do here? I sell and maintain certain goods for the preservation of our order, and I perform some of our ritual sacrifices. Something more? Uh, let's see what you ask for sale first. I ask for paints. Not too bad. Okay, just these things. Uh, tell me about the Blood Sands. This raw, bloody heart of Erglanfoth, where some come to give their essence back to their people, where others seek a noble escape from the trials. The legacy of the builders to the tribes is not merely odd from stone, but a sense of community. And it is here that the Glanfathans come to sacrifice what is most precious, even their own lives, to preserve it. How do these sacrifices work? Like any worthwhile ritual, it's too complex to explain in detail. It involves collecting the supplicant's essence, binding it to their life's blood, and drawing it into a container or a vessel. Farewell. Hey. Okay, so it's not her we talked to. It's someone down here. But on fast mode. The petitioner before you is swaddled in loose fitting robes. Her hair is greasy and matted. A glossy film of sweat and grime coats her exposed skin. She has a swollen feature of pregnancy and several missing teeth in her big, grinning smile. As you approach, she slowly turns to examines you from head to toe, smiling the entire time. Joyous day to you. I am Naka, midwife and lore keeper. Ah, as her eyes scan over her obvious, she clasps her hands in front of her mouth in excitement. And a joyous day to you as well, many colored hunter. Are you here for supplication? Or for strength? How can you see my smell, actually? The autumn stall is in your veins. Galloway gave you ever so much, and yet you wear an eye of whale. As he's given... All he's given me is ostracism, Heravia yells. His voice echoes through the cavernous expanse, and his face becomes flush. I could have been useful to my tribe if my spirit form were a simple fox or crane. Powerful or not, my tribe reviles the... Autumn Stalgar. To them, I am a Soldavarian monster. Don't speak to me like I'm some sort of gift. Heravius, is this one troubling you? Do we need to hurt her? No, it's fine, he says without taking his eyes off the woman. I just thought of a second she was calling me short, that's all. He scratches at his ear stump and sniffs at the woman. So why do you mean that Gilwyn gave me a gift? Hasn't felt like one to me. Galloway would not bless you with a second self that you did not truly need. If the autumn Stalgar feels like an affliction, perhaps you have it backwards. Galloway gives you the tools you need to hunt. He has no cause to burden his hunters unnecessarily. I still don't. Heravius shrugs and scratches his head, shaking loose several mites and gnats. Heravius. Is there something I need to do to cure myself of this spirit form? Cure? My dear child, the autumn Stalgar is the cure. Galloway blessed you with a form so that you may live in reunion. She spreads her arms in a sweeping motion. Walk about the blood sands and read the texts we have preserved in stone. They will tell you what you need to know. What do you mean by living in reunion? Her hand glides across her pregnant abdomen as she stares at you blankly. You smell Heravius a moment before you feel his hand by your side. I don't think she's going to be of any further help. Let's read these scriptures like she said. Farewell. Okay. 
So that's like these things, like as is taken by a first may sustain Upon one. Burial oh. Isle, the two men meet again for the first time, though it was the last thing they did. The many colored beasts rent them both asunder. They were in death, merged, and made whole again. Cute story. Two guys meet in the belly of a soul eating creature. Hmm. Maybe someday I'll eat two of the most insipid deer wooden lumberjacks, and they'll spend an eternity discussing beer whilst haunting my colon. Perhaps the idea is that the autumn Stalgar might not really destroy the souls. That could be true, but I guess I don't know what to make of this. I've never knowingly at least eaten anyone's soul. Maybe it's a tree I have yet to learn. Lucky me! Still, I have a hard time believing that my spirit shifting and mauling anyone is going to make anyone's whole again, despite what the tablet says. I'd like to look at the other tablets to see what they have to say. Hey. Let's find the rest of the tablets. As souls split into multitudes, many lives come from one. The truest of power comes from sacrificing the shard to return its strength to the mother stone. Hmm. The many lives from one sounds familiar. I was taught that sometimes between death and rebirth, a soul splits perfectly in two, creating two viable souls from one. Sounds strange, but it makes sense when you think about how the population has risen in generations. It's kind of a mathematical necessity that some process like this is happening. So why did Whale lead you to this tablet? If that druid really wanted me to see this tablet, and if Whale really is getting my quest for knowledge, if something out there who has the same soul pass as me, so what? That's probably true for most of us. I just can't shake the fear that I'm that I'm the shard and my destiny is to be fed to something greater. Guess rain won't do me any good. Let's read those other tablets. Okay, time to find some more tablets. Tablet. Each generation, the Anumfoth must stand before the autumnal beast in judgment. The wise endure, passing on their strength. The weak are eaten, their souls ripped to pieces and lost for all time, removing such weakness from the cycle. Well, I guess maybe my tribe wasn't entirely wrong about my spirit form being some sort of soul terror. I suppose I was hoping to hear a different answer on the matter, but... A truth is revealed to you and you whine about your dislike for the answer? Whale would be ashamed of you. Two things. First off, don't lecture me on Whale. Second, you're absolutely right. I should be excited by the act of learning, not faulting by my own expectations. Whale would want that. For years I've been telling myself my tribe judged me unfairly. Guess they weren't completely wrong. Well, enough pontification on for the moment. I need to know more. Let's take a look at those other tablets. As your blood flows, so shall your essence. Your life's energy shall feed the soil, and your soul's energy shall enrich the community. This is by your own choosing, Sublicant? Yes. The dwarf grips a hatchet with both hands and raises it over his head. He throws his shoulders forward and swings the weapon to the elf's chest, connecting with a meaty thump. Blood gushes around the blade, and the sacrifice screams rend the air. I did say I wanted to see the teachings of the other druids, but I think I was imagined more dried herbs and chanting. We never did that in my circle back home. Never. Despite his early agreement, the elf thrashes atop the stone table his torso arching while his arms and legs remain tied in place. Meanwhile, the dwarf spreads his arms wide and allows blood to spatter his robes. When the elf is finally silent and still, the dwarf pulls his hatchet from the body and wipes it on his hem. Kana makes a disgusted noise and turns away. I think I preferred these rites when they were only words upon a page. Why did I look? It's not if I didn't expect it. Hey. Okay. Keep searching for more taboos. A tablet tableau. 
Is not the water sacrificed unto the plant, and the plant sacrificed unto livestock, and livestock unto man? When the lesser soul is sacrificed to strengthen the greater soul, the whole of our family grows stronger. I suppose I get the argument. We all have to kill and eat, constantly for that matter, to live. This sounds like it's talking about the Blood Sands rituals. I wonder how, or even if, this is relevant to me. You wear an eye patch as well. I thought you were supposed to love cryptic information like this. A fair point. We all wanted me to see this, so... What about this? About it applies to me. Am I the lesser soul? Was being cast out of my tribe the sacrifice they made that made the greater soul stronger? See, the other tablets spoke of the Stalgard judging, reuniting. And that other one spoke of recombining souls split over the ages. I guess... I'm supposed to use my power to sacrifice others or be sacrificed? Not sure I like the sound of either. Are you rethinking your opinion on Galloway's gift to you? Well, yes and no. Yeah, this put a lot of things in perspective. If you take a step back from it, Galloway must have had a great laugh over how slow a study I am to learn his lessons. I doubt any of this knowledge will change the opinions of my home tribe. And having met some of the other druidic practices out there, I think I'd rather remain a drifter. So what now? Adding it up, I went ahead to Burial Isle. The name was mentioned in the tablets, and it's implied there might be other Autumn Stalgars there. I did not want to hear a verification that the Autumn Stal Stalgar was such a terrifying monster, but I am thankful to Wall that for bringing me to these tablets. The truth is valuable, especially when it is painful. Do you want to rematch with the Autumn Stalgar? Not exactly. I'm older, wiser, and stronger than we when we last hustled, but, um, can't really afford to lose any more eyes or ears. I'm fresh out of redundant organs. Hey. I don't know. I think you still got a kidney there. Okay, so his will progress once we go to Burial Isle, which is one of the later things we do. There is a quest we can pick up in the Hall of Warriors. I am going to do so later because I don't feel like doing it now. <laughs> I, I kind of have a plan of what I want to do. In what order I want to do it. So. Come and fix. Okay, let's go to Old Song. Uh, like this is like the Temple to Galloway, the Temple to Rimmergond, and that's the place to Burial Isle. This leads to the North World, and beyond that is the Temple of Hyla. So first we're going to go around here, we're going to complete a Sagani's quest. Uh, do that one side quest we picked up in the uh, Longhouse. We're going to the Blood Hunt. The figurine. It's glowing. Step lightly. Go into scouting mode. The inscriptions on the altar almost unreadable under a layer of thick moss pay homage to Hylia. Just keep uncovering more map. Wolves. Okay. 
Okay. Hey. Back Let's into scouting mode. Okay, we have some wind blights here. Scouting mode once more. Elder spotted Stelgar. Good little mark. Yeah, it's more Stalgar. Oh, and there's the uh, Stalgar that was killed in the bucket. Over a ground hardened by dry blood and stomp leaves, the corpse of a giant Stelgar crawls with flies. Its flesh has been pierced and cut, as if stabbed by spears and slashed by swords. You touch the dead Stelgar's flank. A crowd of flies stirs into the air, and suddenly you feel the creature's remaining essence. The world fades away. The pack rests, rock shelter the young, full bellies. You turn away and look beyond the trees. The moon breaks over the swaying canopy. A scent of the air stirs a tingling in your mouth. You slide into the shadows, the taste of hunt filling your nostrils. Light shines on the stones by the water that falls. Pray down below. Two-legged, hair like dry grass. It moves near the water that flows, then legs slow, noisy, unaware. It holds a sharp stick. Two-legged hunter, weak hunter. Pray, closer, pray. Bright moon, pray, into the dark. Pain, pain on your side. A sharp stick pokes out of your flank. You roar and shake it. It snaps, breaking on the stones. Wet stones, your blood. Leaves rustle. You look. Another two-legged, another hunter. Thick legs, silent steps, striped face, strong hunter. Enemy. You leap, aiming at its neck. It moves fast. Your claws find flesh, ripping it deep, ripping it down. Wet leaves, two-legged blood. It howls. It fights back. Long claws cut through the air. They slash at your flesh. More pain, sharp pain. You strike. It strikes. Hot blood on your claws. Hot cuts on your chest. The world goes red. Your strength fails. You can't breathe. The two-legged hunter looks down, wet ground, ah, oh, blood, sharp stick above its head, bright moon above its head, strong hunter, the world goes dark. And then we see that a blood trail kind of goes down there. Head up this little branch. Just some materials. You come upon a clearing and see a group of Glanfathans standing in a circle, Sagani glasses from the Audra statue to the hunters, looking for a connection. Meanwhile, the hunters turn and notice you. Their bows are drawn. 
Does the name Persox sound familiar to any of you? What kind of Estramor foolishness is this? They step aside and turn to you, and as they do, you see something on the ground behind them. Lying amidst the ferns is a white stag. Dark blood mars its brilliant coat, and its sides tremble with a quick shallow breaths. You feel a presence in the beast, something ancient familiar. Before you can speak, something thumps to the ground. You look down and see the Audra bear, its bright glow flickering. Sagani draws up beside you, her wide eyes fixing on the dying stag. The figurine, all the time, and it led us here just a moment too late. One of the hunters takes a step forward, and Sagani raises her bow, an arrow knocked. Any closer and you'll bleed out next to him. Her voice is low and tremulous. I thought I'd prepared myself to meet a stranger. To share the honor and history of my village with someone who had no knowledge of us. Even someone who'd scorn our way of life. If you're going to do this, you've got to hurry. I was going to tell him about the years of abundance in the souk. How his granddaughters have hunted caribou, and his grandsons made our walls strong. But he'll be gone in minutes. It doesn't matter what you say. He's dying, and you're doing this for your village. Her face grows still. She kneels by the fallen stag, placing her hand on its head. She begins to speak. Her voice is steady and measured, and her words are guttural and unfamiliar. At first, you think she's reciting a poem in her native tongue. After a moment, you realize that she's listing the names of every person in her village. At least, last, you hear her speak her own name. The stag takes a final shuddering breath and falls still. If you've finished your chanting, we need to get to work before the meat spoils. Did your elders teach you even a mouse dropping's worth of decency? There will be other kills to dress and eat, but there will only be this one chance for Sagani to say her due respects. She looks up at you, and for a moment, horror and anger flash through her eyes. But as she looks at the dead deer, she shrugs and turns, leaving the lustrous otter figure in the dirt. I've finished what I came to do. Let's go. Leave. Hey. There's a cave. All right, then. I'll go on ahead. Well, I'm very curious on that cave. Target the caster. I'm here. There we go. And take down the uh, big guys. Switch back to his hand weapon. This is important. Of course. Go into scouting Quiet. mode. these guys and then the caster following your lead gonna have my ranged folk target the caster try to take it out as quickly as possible there we go. And we can have them assist the uh, rest of the group now. Ah! 
Come on, you can do it, folks. Yeah, I actually want to give this kill to her, obvious, for his uh, staff. I've just been noticing that uh, Zawa's been getting a lot of kills, which, you know, makes sense because uh, he has very low rec recovery time for his between his weapon swings yeah like i think i've only gotten like two including that one like this entire uh game session so i might just finesse a few things and encounters to give her obvious just a few more to speed that up Back into scouting mode. Hmm. Bears. And Kana's song killed the bear. I mean, good for him. Nothing will slip past me. Great used for like oh, here's the bear. I think it like grazed for like two damage, which was just like enough to kill it. Okay, and then there's a soul down there that we can inspect as well. Come on, fast mode. any like particular casters or anything so for the most part we'll just let this play out Looker. This one I will leave for Heravius so he can get his staff fed. Hey. Hey. There's the encounter end. Swamp Lurker. And another one that will let feed her obvious staff. Another life lost to this forest. 
Beneath the raging waterfall, the corpse of an elven Glanfather and hunter lay shattered against the rocks. Broken bones protruded through its skin, but you also notice deep parallel cuts in the rotting flesh. The slashes trace almost every part of the body, as if it has been ravaged by a dozen blades. This man probably died before his fall from the cliffs above. You touch the dead elf's forehead, droplets of water glistening down in purple surface. You feel a sudden jolt from the hunter's lingering essence. The world around you fades away. You're walking among the underbrush without making a sound. Moonlight catches sight of your arms, shining them pale, but you quickly dart again into the shadows of the giant trees of the North Weald. Your blood brother is not so deft as you expected. Look at him, frail, unaware. He doesn't deserve to share the glory of this hunt. It's been countless seasons since a cell Stalgar like this one, twice the size of its lesser kin, has roamed the forest, sneered Red Elves. Othwin fell for the trick. You must feel pity for him, but you convinced yourself that he's he'd only get in the way once the killing began. He'll be safer by the river, expecting that will flank the Stalgar when it comes out to drink, but this kill will be only yours. The Stalgar is larger than you imagined. It stands without fear atop the waterfall's ridge, its silhouette cutting a monstrous hole against the matter of the night sky, a beast of legend, a true hunter. Your hand tightens around the shaft of your father's spear. The weight feels balanced, just right, as you prepare the throw. You put everything into it. The spear flies true and hits its mark. The Stalgar don't even hear a sound. Its blood spills bright on the rocks, yet it stands unfazed. The beast pounces. Moonlight shines over its great fangs. Your hands draw your blades without a second thought as you lunge towards to meet the monster. It's fast. It's ripping your flesh apart. You stab at the darkness engulfing you, deep, again and again, but there's no slowing its embrace. Hey. So we got info for that quest. Head up here. I'll take a look. Go into scouting mode. We were able to get really close. Okay, got that one down. Get the second caster down, folks. She's currently dominated. Take the stone beetle. Stone beetle is currently dominated. Attack the caster again. <laughs> okay, good. Take out that stone beetle. Good. And finally, let's take out this Audra beetle. And I'll leave this one for her obvious to deal with. The one for the staff. Now, enough of these grazes. Oh, come now, Heravius. Truly. Truly. Okay. We're going to... Just kill the beetle. Herophius. For well and for true. Yeah, at least we got one in that encounter. Hey. 
save in here. Okay, and this is to the uh, wind to Hylia's Temple. A winding stair hugs the cliffside, providing an impressive view as you work your way higher and higher. Not too far along the path, however, you find your progress interrupted. A large boulder appears to have fallen onto the road from somewhere high above, and it now sits squarely in your way. Examine the area. The boulder is nearly flush with the cliff face, preventing you from passing by on that side. Along the edge of the cliff, however, there is a narrow space just wide enough to fall across to the other side. The boulder says landing has crashed the steps beneath it, however. Use a hammer and chisel to clear the way. Chiseling your way at the boulder provides a slow and worrying endeavor, especially when several sections of the boulder prove too hard to carve through, forcing you to aim elsewhere. After a long wire, your efforts pay off, and a section of the boulder splits away. You hear the echoing cloud of rocks tumbling down the side of the cliff. The sound seems to stir something overhead. A shadow crosses the path, quick as lightning, and vanishes before you can catch a glimpse of what cast, has cast it. But you do see several grain silhouettes that of several more rocks flung down at you from above. Scrambling to action, the party ducks under a small rocky protrusion along the cliff, but Clarence Wong stumbles and is left just short of shelter. A sudden hailstorm of fist-sized rocks and scattered debris rains down upon them. Battered and bruised, Clarence Wong leaps the final distance to safety. After a short while, the thrumming rubble, thundering rubble of falling stones fades away. Your uh, ordeal passed, you continue a climb, and the rest of your dream proceeds without incident. At least you're finding yourself at the base of the final twisting set of steps, above which you can see the towering pillars of Hylia's nest. Okay. So before we continue any further in Hylia's nest, there's a few things we're going to do. First, we're going to head back to Hearthsong, turn in that quest. Life of a traveler. So many ruins to uncover, places to see. Indeed. Be ready for a break. It is true. You have been at it far longer than I. Where will you go next when you have all the world to choose from? Home, of course. More. I've concluded my task. It's time to speak with the Amonfoth. What did you see? Where's Firum? Tell me. Did I? The truth belongs to all of us, even Earthwin. You know this. I'm ready to share the truth with the Amonfoth, and I'll make sure th that so is Earthwin. Uh, I've been investigating Firum's disappearance. Indeed, Arthur and Varadai have spoken of little else. I do not envy your position, Gallus and Amans, yet your testimony may resolve the tensions between the Keepers of Stone and the Twice-Split Arrows. When you've gathered your evidence, I'll call a hearing. Let's begin. I will summon Arthur and Varadai. Their fates and the names of their tribes depend on what you reveal to us, Gallus and Amans. Bethrol stands at the head of the hall, lit from behind by dozens of candles. She casts a long shadow across the floor. We've gathered to weigh the claims of Arthoth and Vredai in the matters of Firm's dis disappearance. To that end, we are honored by the presence of Agawas Anams, whose insight will help us render a verdict. We begin with Arthrin's claim. He asserts that Firm lured him into a confrontation with the Stelgar, and that he slew the beast on his own. Firm, he says, exiled himself fearing that knowledge of his actions would heap shame upon the Keepers of Stone. As evidence, he brings a thing from the Great Stalgar. On the other hand, Redai states that his brother was tricked and murdered by Arthur during the hunt. A hunter of Firm's renown would not have fallen into the blood hunt, but by treachery. Her shadow flickers and dances in the candlelight as she looks at you. And now we turn to a Galbus Anamas. 
We ask only that you share your observations, that we might find closure for these two tribes. What fate fell? What fate fell? What fate befell? Firom. Firom exiled himself. Othran lets out a sigh of relief. I have claimed so from the beginning. Whatever other tribes think of us, the twice-split arrows stand by the truth. Do not forget your place. It saddens me to know this, but we must still reveal it deeper. If that is so, how did the giant Stalgar die? Othran killed the giant beast. There you have it. I claim the victory. You didn't expect such a feat from a twice-split arrow, did you? Silence! And now we come to it. Claim the truth of the six tribes, Glauna and Amos. Uh, Firam exiled himself in shame after Othran, the hunter of much less renown, managed to kill the giant Stelgar in single combat. Your words echo along, along the patch of the six to a solemn audience. Bethel, Bethel nods. If it is as you say, we thank you for sharing the truth with us. The Amphathan turns to Othran in red eye. Brothers of the tribes, let these wounds mend, go in peace, and contemplate the shame brought into our hearth. Hey. Arthur avoids looking at you directly as you approach, scratching his patchy stubble. He searches the ground as if for an answer. I, I don't know why or, or how, but you came when you, we most needed a friend. Our hope remains thanks to you. My tribes will never forget what you've done for us. I'll never forget. Please, I know it's a humble token, not with what you've given us. Othran unwraps an elongated bundle of animal skins. We have very little, but he is one of our finest weapons. Fit for the best hunters in Eglonfoth. Take it and do the twice split arrows this one more honor. The hunter bows and turns around. After a few long strides, Othran glances back, a wide smile sparks across his panicked, his patched golden fuzz. Lines air added to inventory. All right, let's see what that weapon is. Yeah, I've never done the quest that way. Enchantment site alone. Now we play the fun game of find the weapon. Oh. That's probably right here. Fast. So it's a superb hunting bow. 3DRB bypass. Inflicts DR 17 for 5 seconds on hit. Not bad. The next heir, Eagle Eye, was the prized possession of a Glanfather hunter from the infamous Three Tusk Stelgar tribe. As she never went anywhere without it, it was never truly determined whether the weapon accuracy owed more to her skill or that of its maker. She fought in the War of Black Trees and was driven out of cover by the fires. It's said that her fear for Lenin's ear was so great she charged headlong into a squadron of soldiers. Even so, she felled seven of them before they brought her down. Okay, what do you currently have equipped? Masak Hunting Bow. Just only eight accuracy. Yeah, this is just better. Hey. I do want to talk to Sagani. A deer in the middle of Air Glonfoss. And I wasted five years yeah. looking for it. So you got a few more viewers in the chat? Howdy there. How's your night going? Hope you've had a good week. At least you'll be back with your family soon. Not for how long? A season? A century? One day something will separate us. Cold, famine, illness... And when it does, we'll be cast to the wheel and flung to new corners of existence. Like snowflakes scattered on the wind. Everything in life is finite. Can't argue with that. Enough about me. How about you? Do you feel like you understand the purpose of your search for Theos? There is no purpose, but I have to find him to preserve my soul. Difficult to have a burden like that thrust on you. Harder still when you know you won't find deeper satisfaction once it's lifted. Anyway, Theos isn't getting any closer. I suppose we'd best keep after him. Let's go. Hey. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to head over to the Celestial Sapling. I'm going to switch out Sagani for Grieving Mother. 
And then we're going to head up to uh, the roost of, to Hylia's roost to deal with the Sky Dragon. Zawa, you mind if I borrow some of that Malkachoa? You are searching for insight? Nah, I was just going to feed it to Durance while he was sleeping and pretend to be the ghost of Aethys. I also have a pepper that will make him think he is being slowly devoured by a great serpent, if you are interested. Shall pay that which shall... Fuming with anger and pacing in tiny circles, the Valian merchant aims his wild rant at you as you approach. You there! Have you come here to trade with the savages? Learn from my example and take your business elsewhere. Liars, cheats, swindlers. That duplicitous bitch, Alare. She claims to be selling Eldrath Gola flower buds, but all I have now is six bushels of common house plants. These herbs are useless. He throws a handful of dry plants to the ground, stomping out the brittle stems and leaves, kicking up a pungent, savory scent. I'll keep my, I'll get my money back from that swindling savage. Uh, what did Alari say when you confronted her? Nothing of substance. She defended herself, of course, saying the herbs were legitimate. Why would she, why wouldn't she lie? No one will value my word over hers. Lari can lie with impunity when surrounded by her gangs of th savage thugs. What do you intend to do about this? When I get my hands on, when Anto halts his sentence, his eyes darken around at the nearby grandfather and guards. I am in the savage's home court, so that's my word against hers. Where does that leave me? I'd be a fool to threaten her here on tribal soil. I cannot sell those worthless herbs to recover my coin, and I am powerless to confront Alhari. I don't suppose. If you were willing to mediate, perhaps, we could succeed where I have failed. I would, of course, pay you handsomely for your troubles. I'll see what I can do. And I do want to see what he has just for sale. Oh, and he's just saying, oh, I have little left. He indeed does. Hey. Okay, let's head up to the Celestial Sapling. Good day, stranger. Uh, Sverneth, a slender woman in dusty leathers locks eyes with you. It's good to see someone far more, from more civilized lands around her. Here, yeah, yeah, around here, her unkempt hair sprouts in wavy black tufts. Despite the fine features that sculpt her face, a cleft chin completes her boyish appearance. I'm leaving, f learning firsthand that many shortcomings of grandfather and hospitality. Her gloved hand comes to rest on the pommel of her long estoc, cinched low on her hip. I can almost forgive the hostility towards outsiders, but the temperate taverns in these watered-down drinks. Inexcusable. I hope I don't seem too forward, but I need your help, my friends, and you look like the right person for the job. Which is to say you're not Glenfather, making the closest thing I've got to an ally in this paranoid land. She gives you a coquettish sideways glance, and allies, well, they help each other, do they not? What help do you need? My friends have drawn some unwanted attention. Swineth looks to both sides, scanning for uninvited listeners. Then father and scouts, and not just any mob of local zealots, the Fangs, she pauses to let the name sound in the air. The Fangs are a brutal, relentless bunch, eager to make an example of troublesome outsiders. As for why I need your help, her smile widens as she speaks, I need someone to warn the expedition, expedition that trouble's coming, and I need someone ready to fight if it comes to that. She taps her hand on the palm of her estoc. With any luck, we'll reach my friends before the fangs do. But if not, the fangs have a reputation to uphold, so this might require spilling blood. Uh, why aren't you with the rest of your friends? Why not warn them yourself? Her posture stiffens at the question. It was my turn to handle for our patrol. I swiped the fangs on my trek back to camp. I knew that rejoining the main group would risk leading the enemy right back to the expedition. I know the woods and know how to stay quiet, but I didn't want to t stake my friend's life on my ability to sneak past expert hunters like the Fangs. If they noticed me warning my friends, we'd have been overrun. Uh, but if they noticed me and some reinforcements like, say, you, well, at least we can scare them off or put up a good fight. What did your friends do to draw the attention of the Fangs? Just setting foot in Air Glanfoth is a good way to offend the tribes. I don't know... How they picked up our trail, I suspect one of our newest scouts didn't cover his tracks well enough. When I spotted the, spotted the fangs, they were retracing a path the expedition had taken days before. Tell me more about your expedition. 
I like to think we're on a mission of reclamation. It is said that our armies left behind many verbas in the hasty retreat from Eir Glanforth at the end of the War of Black Trees. So the way I see it, we're simply gathering up what our ancestors left behind. I doubt the Glanfathoms would agree with me on this. My expedition's set up from Defiance Bay heading directly east to cross into the Glanfathon lands. I slid off once we arrived at the Bale, the natural frontier between our nations. The plan was for me to keep up my eyes on the Glanfathons while the main group scoured the target area. For days we eluded them, but the fangs got wise to our presence. Your friends are trespassing. By local custom, they're criminals. You'll forgive me if I'm not sympathetic with face painters and their barbaric laws. I'm not pretending that we... What we're doing is noble. I just don't believe that trespassing is a crime that warrants execution. I hope you won the expedition. Excellent. I know I could count on you. Assuming the fangs never already get them, my friends should be now be or at around the Pilgrim's Trail in the North Weald. The plan was to camp along a trail leading to the Temple of Hyla. Find my comrades, warn them the fangs are coming, and help them clear out of the force. I'll head out first on my own to see if I can't lead the fangs astray and buy us some time. If the gods smile on us, we won't have to draw steel. Should it come to that, I'm glad you are on our side. Hey. I'm just going to be poking around here. Those are the monks that we could give an item to had uh, we not just said nope and let someone die. Okay. And well met. Uh, let me see what you have for sale. Hmm. Okay, so let's dismiss Sagani, bring in Grieving Mother. Um, get some resting bonus. Hey. and head back to the Temple of Hyla. Actually, this is the cl closest uh, point. And on my way back from here is when I plan to do the uh, Northweld quest we just picked up. Okay, so as Clarence Wong follows the dice in his head on making all decisions, this could go simply or less simply. I'm going to put a save in here. I actually really like the designs they do for the dragons in these games. Large. As you reach the summit of the mountain, a gust of wind stirs the air. You hear a noise like the snapping of sails and the sky briefly blotted out. A dragon lands before you, shaking the ground beneath your feet. It draws itself up to its full height and spreads its wing, barring your passage. Its neck, its back, and the ridge of its spine are covered with magnificent plumage. It hisses at you, and while the sound is unlike any language you've ever heard, the beast's meaning is utterly clear. Vermin invading my nest, threatening my hatchling. You shall feed my young. A small worm crouches in a corner of the temple behind the dragon. Be careful, watcher. Her mind is on edge, not with hunger, but with fear. There's little more dangerous than a mother defending her offspring. Oh, dice. Not if I kill you both. Okay. <sighs> Maximum effort. Oh, wait. Of course she goes up. Okay. 
Ravius. Kitty cat man if you would. Actually, I'm just going to take out the ads first. She's resistant to being prone, but you know, we could get lucky. What else is she? Immune to. Immune to stuck. Frightened. Terrified or unconscious. Else. Actually, Zaba. Okay, good. She's petrified. Which would be great if we had people who could attack. I'll use my last spell to try to do a petrification again. She's just immune to lightning damage. Which... Okay, shock or pierce. Good. So she can do something. Going to use disintegrate. Bring in a phantom. Just start unloading damage. No, Herapius. Okay, good. Do your heal. Have him cast from that in the storm. Don't know how much it's actually going to be good for, but hey. It only knocked down one of us, so I'll take it. Oh, it does uh, slightly stagger her. That's nice. I will bring the moon well in. Eh, have him go to Discipline Barrage. Why not? Alongside sacrifice and accuracy. Come on. Get over it. Get over it. Okay. Bring forth another phantom. Keep unloading. Damage. Phantom do attack. Oh yeah, let's use a sun man spell. Why not? God, stun lock. I want you to move back because you seem to be really stunned by her a lot. Uh, what other spells can we use for you, my dude? Use another storm. Mm. 
more missiles. Yeah, and you you all just keep on turn the off. Keep bringing down. Lavaro, be on seek. Giving them a fair shot. Lavaro, be on seek. Cast insects. Another phantom. Yeah, because they have such a low chance of hitting with anything. It's weird. Cast another moon well. <laughs> you should have run! Missiles. This weapon's no good. To me. Yeah. Its defenses are so freaking. Yeah, it's deflection of uh, ninety-eight. Versus, like, most of my guys have an accuracy of, like, 49, 68, 44, 37. Why are our accuracy so freaking... Oh, because they're terrified of the goddamn Sky Dragon. So it's... No wonder it's so freaking low. They're 20... Freaking 20% malice to what they would normally do. More missiles. We are probably going to graze this thing. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Connor deals 2.2 .2 damage to Sky Dragon. Two misses on Bun Grace. We are going to graze this thing to death. Oh, ye gods. So. It should be no Ooh, Sky Dragon Eyes, those are useful. So it should be no that while I guess I am playing this on easy, all that does is um change the amount of enemies in the encounters. Like there would have been more ads had we been on normal. God and Thronta. Forged by the Master Smith of the Knights of the Crucible, uh God's Thunder, God's Thunder, saw greatest use during the War of Defiance. Dedicated to Abaddon and inscribed with his holy symbol, the hammer held devastating power and could leave foes senseless with a single blow. In the thick of battle, warriors would often claim to hear thunderous explosions and witness blinding flashes of light. Many believed the gods themselves disapproved of fighting and were wasting their displeasure. So it's a Warhammer. Tash can stun and crest plus one might and fine. Rather okay. Ooh, Willbreaker. Yes, give me spells. Hey. So basically all the stats of the end, and there were like 
the uh, fodder we basically just tore through within the first, like, few seconds of combat. But, like, then it's like, this one main dragon is just like, ugh. I got something here. Hmm, a ring of might. Not bad. Hey. But we are going to rest here. Half asleep, a tide of deafening whispers assails you, chipping away at your senses. As your mind's understanding of itself, the war, the roar is louder with each passing night, their attacks more brazen, less confined to your subconscious. A familiar voice fights its way through the din, calling out to you. Hey, hey. Adair rolls his eyes, relieved to see you looking back at him. Oh! Just about punched you to snap you out of it. You're saying things, but there weren't any words I ever heard. Were shaking so hard I thought you'd crack your spine. What happened to the bucket of cold water? Adair shrugs and looks away, concealing his smile poorly. Okay. What would I do without a friend to punch me? Nice to feel needed. I'd have woke you sooner, but I thought it'd be nice for you to be able to close your eyes a bit. Folks don't last long without sleep. You're, oh. You're twitchy these days. Reminds me of Mirwald more than I'd like. Anything I can do, you just let me know. Okay, and with that, we have completed all the upgrades for a storm caller. So it grants crackling bolts uh, twice per rest. Not bad. Uh, it's superb now. Uh, it grants bulwark against the mess and has soul shock. Okay. So, as the siege stretched on, the harbor master called for more archers, promising a reward to anyone who could land an error on the sea fang. One young glam felon came forward, but with the harbor master saw her hunting bow, he laughed, explaining that she'd need a top quality longbow at the least, but she insisted. And when the harbor master led her to the cliff, she called a storm that struck the sea fang and turned the waves around it. The harbor master watched as the sea fang sank before his eyes. When the wreck washed ashore, the Glemfeather drew Stormcaller and plucked an arrow into the broken mast. Plunked an arrow into the broken mast. Okay. Because the final upgrade for that was to uh, rest in the Lay of a Sky Dragon. And he just still needs two more kills with for his final upgrade. St. Ifens Not has also concluded. In Yemgal, Aloth met with the priest of Abaddon to discuss the mysteries of who had stolen the smith's whole artifacts and for what purpose. During the investigation, a quirky priest of Wea lent the group his bizarre form of help, answering to the thief's riddles posed at different, as different riddles. After tracking down each stolen artifact through a series of additional clues, Aloth and the priest of Abaddon realized that the priest of Wea was the thief. Very pleased with himself, he had no objection to being captured and sent to the Earl of Yemer for punishment. When Aelof left the priest of Abaddon, they were still trying to determine the point of the theft. So, this gets Ifrin's Cradle, uh, which can be used five times. It's a foe target plus three meter radius, and it uh, just suspends beneficial effects on them for 20 seconds. Skeins of magical energy can tangle enemies in the air of effect, binding up beneficial effects for the duration, which... Honestly, yeah, she seems fairly useful if you remember to use it <laughs> and use it well. Um, okay. And the Sky Dragon Eyes are actually used for. Like, say. Um, superb quality uh, weapon enchantments. So, like, if there's just a basic weapon we wanted to enchant. Like, this one currently has Damaging Tomb, which gives, uh... Really? It doesn't show me the screen what it does. Like, it has Damaging too, which is, like, plus 30% damage. We could potentially like make it superb, which would give it 12% more accuracy and 45% more damage. Uh, it would use up both of our Sky Dragon Eyes, though. So I'm 
less inclined to use it on lead splitter. Even though it's a pretty nice weapon. Um, hey. Like, I believe for armor and chance. Yeah, it's an Archer Dragon scale for armor enchantments. Hey. So let's go to Northweald and deal with that quest we got over at the Gleaming Zap Celestial Sapling. Just go in fast mode. More Stelgar. to get Heravius some kills here, but uh, the kitties are thinking otherwise. Shockingly, I know. want to do is feed the staff and the enemies just kill the Caravius. I mean, hey. fair play, but still, I don't think I got anything on that one. Nope. Hey. Just looking over some of the uh, reputations I have. Stop! Friend or foe! The man in blood-soaked armor points his blade at you as his wounded and buried comrades flock into position behind him. A trickle of blood runs down, runs from a cut on his brow down to his neck. Staining a locket worn on a gold chain. You're not Clown Fawthen. He tightens the grip of the sword's handle. By Magrin, friend or foe, I say. Uh, let's see what the dice decide. Calm down, I'm a friend. Sword still pointing at you. The man gives a sideways glance to his companions and nods. The mercenaries lower the weapons. A warrior in welcome sight. Friends this far from home. He lets the weight of his sword lower his arm. He gives a concerned look to his mercenary company. Look at us, hiding the rocks and holding it in our guts. The fangs. They've bloodied us and now we're trapped. Oh, dice. Sorry, friend. I'm with the Glanfathens. <laughs> the man brings his fist to his lips and kisses the locket. Sereta, raise him strong. Well, you're labeled as a healer, so let's kill you first. Uh, backline, though, do you know your anti mage stuff. Take out the rogue. They can be pesky. And again, the rogue, for they are persnickety. And just to know some good old fashioned uh, kind of 
focused fire. Ashia dare, why don't you go out and knock down the cat? I'll try to. There we go. Detonate him. Better try something else. Hmm. Just five of that. Oh, uh, let's play everyone's game. Everyone's perfect game. Can Haravius kill it before it kills him? Need something? Not a problem. Clarence, please run. Clarence. Okay, there we go. I mean, the mercenary captain in this war here was being very smart in trying to kill the wizard. But, uh... Not so smart in turning his back on the, uh... Halfling. Or no. Thank you, Adair, for taking the kill. Exceptional great sword, exceptional breastplate. Hey. Eh, get wall of flame and my grammar imprint from this at least. Hey. Interesting, that did not automatically fail the quest. Okay. Many blessings, traveler. We witnessed the assault. You would make a strong hunt master. The woman stands next to her great stag, petting his thick neck. She turns her head in your direction and gives you a nod of approval. Leaving the ammo behind, she walks towards you. You have our gratitude, Estamora. Though we could have dealt with the bluters on our own, you spilled blood in our name. We honor such sacrifices. She bows to you with a smile. In glory of your assistance, and to offer your strength for your next hunt, I wish to share with you either our craft, our skill, or our bounty, which you feel is most worthy of you. I would be honored to wield a weapon crafted by one fallen hands. She looks among the fangs and locks eyes with one of her warriors. She gnaws at him. He approaches you and drops to one knee and silently presents his weapon to you. It is rare for us to find new friends amongst the Estramoran. The fangs will speak well of you, and we will await the day our paths cross once again. She turns to her group and gives them a short command. The soldiers depart, and the great stag quickly falls after the fangs disappear into the dense cover of the North Wales foliage. Prey marker added to your stash. Let us see what this praying marker does do. So it's another hunting bow. Accurate three, plus 12 accuracy, plus 15 damage, plus one perception. Okay. It's okay. Okay. So that should be that for that. Let's head back to Hearthsong. Because real quick, I do have uh, Pelagia's uh, quest to do. And that's easy as uh, just talking to the... Uh, Bethrail with the uh, 
turn your party. And it looks like we have a prestigious visitor. A wealthy noble by the name of Lord Sidorak has arrived at your stronghold. He seeks your aid in defending his keep from rivals. I can go see him after we uh, finish up here. Oh, we can also... Uh, first, let's go over to the Hearthstone Market. See what we can uh, mediate with that one merchant thingy. The herbalist. Can I pick up this orange tabby cat? Yes! A tabby cat snaps out of its plastic to press your approach. It... It opens its eyes wide, following your every step before trotting to your side to rub against your legs. You have gained an item orange tabby cat add to the stash. Yes. A young girl looks at about the market with a disinterested gaze. As you near, she snaps to her attention and strains the posture. Welcome, Esther Moore, she says with a curtsy. Alari is not here, so I'm running to the shop while she's away. She glides her hands in front of the display cases of poultices and remedies. If you're looking for herbs, tinctures, oils, or ointments, then I've got everything you'll ever need. I'm looking for Alaria. Where might I find her? She lives not far from here. The little girl points out the exit out of the market. Climb over the stairs. At the top, there's a circle of ruins. Do you know it? It's on the north side of Hillsong. Anyway, her house is right there. The door faces those ruins. Please show me your wares. Of course. Have a look. Okay, just basic stuff. Actually, I'm going to check the merchants here, see what they got. Decent mace. Eh, nothing like really. Eh. Okay. Estramore. Okay, he's just a. Materials vendor. Many blessings, traveler. Club. Free grace to hit. Stunning. Oh, that's okay. That's, eh. Okay, but pretty much anyone you'd put it on would already have. Most of perception isn't that bad. Hey. Hail Estramore. Okay, nothing really much there. Okay. Let's see if we can find Alari. No, that's Lindsay. Perhaps the other door. An old elven woman stands tall and proud, surrounded by grandfathered warriors that study your every move. You speak on Renato's behalf, I presume. 
I knew he would convince someone to do his bidding. I did not suspect it would be the Estramore involved in all the chaos at Defiance Bay. She tilts her head to the side and blinks slowly. Does the presence of my armed entourage concern you? You were expecting a defenseless shopkeeper, am I right? Alari raises her dye-stained hand just as one of her guard begins to rush forward to stillness. She barks at her attendant. Give the Estramore a chance to speak. You are not dear wooden beasts. Here, hospitality reigns. Alhari nods at you, holding up an open hand, her palm and fingers covered in blue and green dye. Envoy of the Valian, speak the message you were sent to deliver. I don't care about the Valian. Maybe I can help you instead. You would turn on him. Renato must vanish from our sacred city. He sows distrust and must be rooted if you wish to help convince him to be elsewhere. The clan father and hospitality must be observed, always. He is to be given a chance to leave on his feet before he bleeds out on his back. Deliver, in our name, a warning. Tell Renato that if he does not leave, he will be accused of conspiring to pilfer and with and willocks from our lands. He won't risk a trial by the council of the young father. If he won't listen, tell him that his faulty member will end in a cage, just like this black beetle, food for our birds. The reputation of your tribe is tied to your actions. Is that how you want future trading partners to remember your kin? The clan fathers look at each other, faces alight with disagreement. A murmur of voices rises among around the dwelling's hearth until a lorry, eyes shut tight, stomps on the ground with force. Enough. Stillness. She waits until her brethren's voices die down before opening her eyes. You speak with long settled judgment. Trade strengthens all the tribes, and Renato's claim, false as it is, may spread just to poison us. We will suffer the indignity of letting the sly profit if it means safeguarding the peaceful, honorable court of Twin Elms. Laurie pu pulls up one sleeves, revealing a leather bag hanging from his hand. The clinking of copper fills the room. Take this to the back to the veiling with the blessings of the Fisher Crane tribe. I think we picked up a few too many spoils. Okay, I was not expecting that outcome. So we'll give that to him on the way back to the Celestial Sapling to swap out some party members, get Palagi in the party, and then... Does anyone have any extra rations? I did some white leaf, and now I'm very hungry. Speak to the uh, on father with her. Gods keep you. I got you going back. Diveris? Renato's eyes widen as his hands greedily snatch up your purse. Belfato, I had almost given up hope. Renato counts the coins, spawn which each clink of copper. My thanks to you, friend. With this, I can finally restock my wares. Come find me at the Celestial Sapling. I'm sure I can find some choice items for resourceful customers like you. To announce, moderate negative. How is my twin ups? Okay, still faintly good. Time being to swap out of there. I'll be swapping him back in once we're done with her quest. Might as well level her up. Some stealth. Nothing can take the one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So roll our d12. Four. Sworn enemy. This is actually a good one. Marks an enemy with the focus of a pound's righteous fury, granting accuracy and damage bonuses against the target until combat ends or the target goes down. It's once per encounter, and once the uh, foe is marked, um, she gets 20% damage and 50%, 50 accuracy against marked targets. Okay, skills. May she roll something that makes sense. Mechanics, and then we have four left. So it's going to go into mechanics. Okay, now let's see if we get a talent that actually makes her good. 
potentially we have a class down so we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen roll our d20 And that is a 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Rhymer's Summon. This rhyme mimics the Chanter's ability to summon skeletons, though it cannot be used until some time has passed in combat and cannot be used frequently. So after at least 15 seconds in combat, we can use it and just summon two human skeletons. What I was hoping for was to roll a 3 and get Wrath of the Five Sons. So this is something that is exclusive to uh, Pelagia, uh, given her order. So, whenever the Pelagia uses a sworn enemy, five orbs of flame leap from his or her hand and fly toward the target. Foe target, 3 to 19 burn damage, 10 DR bypass. An additional plus 20 accuracy versus deflection is once per encounter. And this is just an amazing ability. It can... Uh, End enemies, or like bring them to near death, or really just set things up for something great. But instead, we have Rhymer Summits. Okay. Oh wait, let me let me roll something that makes sense. Mechanics. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, so roll that d12. 3. Liberating Exhortation. Commands an ally to summon all their strength in order to temporarily ignore existing hostile effects. These effects will resume once Liberating Exhortation ends. So twice per encounter, uh, she can suspend hostile effects on a tar friendly target for 23 seconds. Okay. Ah, I'm on the vanguard. I often dreamed of visiting the Republic. People value trade. Trade of all things, it's true. And competition between the Republics keeps us strong. Rawatai is a unified nation with fleeter ships. Someday it may prove a worthy competitor. There's more to dominating trade than fast ships. Maybe you could write a poem to help your countrymen figure it out. Wait. I don't know if I should go through with this. Make the trade deal with the Anamenfa. If a valiant deal with the Glanfad and weakens the Deerwood, it could mean war for the Republics in the future. Uh, you've had enough time to wrestle with your inner turmoil. I need to talk to the Amenfath and I'm not waiting on your conscience, understand? She cleanses her jar in anger but remains silent. One of my companions, a representative of the Valian Republics, wishes to discuss a trade issue with you. Yes, the Valian Godlike, blessed by Hylia. So they say. Uh, and diplomat of the Duke Bells, I understand that you were to be sent here with trade assurances from your masters. Vid Amen and Amanveth. It is true that I was chosen to convey these assurances, but understand that I was fashioned more for war than etiquette. The ones mark slightly. In these dangerous times, Pred is better to send warriors to do diplomats' work. Pelagia musters a weak smile. Indeed, Anafrath, regarding the exclusive trading agreement, her voice quavers slightly and her golden eyes dart in your direction. Shrug. Pelagia hesitates for a moment before her eyelids drop in resignation. The Republics are fully committed to exclusive trade on all previously discussed goods for the next five years. The dear ones still do not know of your intentions, do they? When they find out. We are aware of the risk, Amenfath, but we believe this is the right time for our people to begin a new trade venture with yours. Very well. We will send MSA south to discuss the details at greater length. Your appearance speaks well of your duke's intentions. Revered Amenfath. I followed my orders. 
I can only hope the dukes are right, and the Deerwood doesn't go to war with us over this. The dukes don't leave you much choice. What could you do? I could have done something, but chose not to when the moment came. Nothing to be done about it now. All right. Let's find Theos. Now, this I actually does... Um, So she is a party member in uh, Pills of Eternity 2 Deadfire. And the consequences of this uh, do affect um, the position she's in at the beginning of Deadfire. Need something. I'm ready. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the inn, swap back in a dare. How do you do? Cores. Hope you're not expecting much. Uh, also, rest. Hey. Let's see what he has. Oh, just a bunch of traps. Yay. Hey. Okay. So I am going to go and pick up a quest. So we are going into here to pick up a fun little quest. Estramore. A grizzled old elf, his hair braided and dyed, stands at one end of the hall. His arms and chest are crosshatched with pale seams of scars. His crooked smile looks like another. It's not many Estramor who are permitted into our sacred city. Bethrel must be feeling especially soft today. Edir pays, no, pays no attention to the elf. Instead, instead has locked eyes with Stalgar in front of him. He whispers, Do you think you'd mind if I pet a Stalgar? So, uh, where I'm from, petting a Stalgar doesn't mean what you think it means. Come to hear our future editor, Everon, or to make your own at the Blood Sands. What do you do here? I'm as Amfroth of the Three Tusk Stelgar, I guide our tribe in all matters. I'm in Twin Elms to confer with some of the other Amfroth about the Onerlofen, your Hollowborn. We only have such buffs here on occasion, but it has made us more vigil vigil vigilant about our neighbors. There are some of us who believe you, your Onerlofen, to be a punishment for the defilement of the Builder sites. Others say it's a plague carried by the Estramorn. People make it what they want it to be, and when it ends, if it ends, they'll make up reasons for that too. 
Something else? Tell me about the Three Tusk Stalgar. The boldest and fiercest of the six great tribes of Eric Lanfoth. It was we who first defended against the Estramorn who came to the shore 200 years ago. We have always been the border tribe, and it has always fallen to us to hold the line against outsiders and invaders. The way they keep mentioning battles of old, you think that the Three Tusk Martyr tribe. They are indeed fierce that their history is rife with glorious deeds. I sometimes think they'd fight the other tribes if they didn't have trespassers to hunt. What's Blood Sands? An ancient place of sacrifice, in a cave by the great elms themselves. Restin and his druids have become an integral part of Banfoth and society for generations. No matter what some of the other tribes might say, Eglonfoth has held its own against the Estramorn because some of us still understand the power of sacrifice. You, on the other hand, you seem like one who can appreciate the cruel necessity. You don't seem fond of us, Estramorin. I have fought in the broken stone war and the war of black trees. I saw my brethren cut down defending the palaces, the places of the builders, and I shed blood alongside Laven Vigd himself. Now, now the Estramorin seem to think that they will find a cure for the empty children among our sacred sites, or worse, that they will find sanctuary in our lands. And I've seen what happens when we when they set their sights on Glanfathen's soil. Well, he does have a point. You learn not to trust your neighbors when they defy your lands, habitually, for several generations. He's got all the reason in Aeora to worry. And this worries you? I have seen too many wars for this not to worry me. In my 250 years, I've led my people through two wars. Our boars have remained intact, and largely through the reputation of the Three Tusks Stelgar. I've sired a dozen children, but none have been deemed fit to take my place. I care nothing for the legacies that obsess the Estramorn lords, but it is important that my successor continue this path. If your own children don't succeed you, what happens? Ordinarily, the Ria would turn to others in my tribe, to clan heads and their families. Ordinarily. But we share a traditional fostering the children of other tribes. The Amon Fath of Fisher Crane have entrusted his youngest to my care. And as none of my own blood are fit to take my place, the Rao will look next to this bog child, the kin of another almond father, my foster daughter, to take my place. You should be so lucky, Heravius trips. This young fisher crane lass is a great gift. You should be thankful. Heravius' voice becomes a low whisper, especially given your family feebleness. Couldn't you just send her back to her family? That would be a grave insult to the Fisher Crane. The repercussions of with the other Anamathoth would be severe. I have no doubt that she would make a fine leader, but not among the three tusks Stelgar. The old lands of Fisher Crane have lived in Thainbog for two for a thousand years. They are cunning and furtive by nature, which shows them well when they have swamplands to hide their movements. But this will not deter the Estramon on open ground. That's an unkind summary. From what I've read, you have to look between the lines. At all the frustrated daring commanders writing about the unseen enemy harrying the forces. A little sabotage and a few good ambushes can turn the tide of any conflict. Our savagery has deterred the Estramorn from further encroachment. They still tell of our deeds in the Broken Stone War, but if a child of Fisher Crane leads our tribe, we will lose that boldness, and the Estramorn will lose their fear of us. This child will be influenced by the souls of her ancestors. In times of crisis, she will look to her kin in Thanebog for guidance. No matter what I might try to teach her, it will not be enough. This, there's a way you could help. Few have the stomach for it, but I think it would suit someone of your inclinations. Say nothing. The Orlan girl has the soul of a leader. If it were passed to one of my own offspring, our tribe would remain strong. The druids of the Blood Sands have a way to do this, and they understand the importance of a strong line of succession for Three Tusks Delgar. Edda rubs the bridge of his nose, but he rattles it, his head as if to clear cobwebs. So all we have to do is steal a baby's soul. What's the catch? He gives you a key. There's a house in Southeast Hearthsong next to the river. The child will be asleep. I've arranged for her to be unattended for a time. Take her and bring her to keep her verder in blood sands. She knows what must be done. When she presents you with the liquid essence, bring it back to me. Uh... What will keep a word to do with the child? Have you seen the rituals of the blood sands? She will sacrifice her. It is the only way to distill her essence. The grieving mother draws back in horror. What evil is this? 
to murder a child over a matter of politics? We cannot allow this corruption, this madness to thrive. Go on, child, go on. Okay. So I have kind of three real options that I won't do this. I do not relish the deed, but two centuries of leadership have taught me that all things bear a cost. Consider it well, Asmara. I'm not above rewarding those who are of service. Okay, that's all. The chore is regrettable, but it is also necessary. Have we journeyed so far to become tangled in matters of politics, pettiness? We must not do this, Watcher. We have come to serve, save the children, the future of the Deerwood. I will not stand by if you do this evil. Goodbye. Hey. Okay. So, that starts this quest. And this guy here is going to give us a different option. Yes. A young man approaches you with a swift and purposeful stride. While he never met him before, he has the same stern wild look as Simic. He doesn't speak until he's right next to you. When he does, his voice is quiet. Wait, I saw you speaking with my father. Say nothing. He asked you to sacrifice Vela, hasn't he? He grits his teeth. Maybe he's right about three tusks Stelga growing weak. But if this is the price of strength, it isn't worth it. The tribes have survived this long because we've stuck together. Did he just... Did a three tusk... Three tusk Stelga say something wise? I do indeed live in strange times. I would never hurt the child. I would like to believe you, but your reputation suggests otherwise. Still, even if you do not, my father will find someone who will. He doesn't give up on an idea easily, but there may be a way to stop him. Is an herbalist among the ovaries of the Golden Grove. Belta, that's her name. They all gather southeast of here by the river. She could brew poison. Simic wouldn't know the difference until it's too late. There's an easy way to kill Simic, you know. His words would surround you in no time. Besides, it's simple as if this happens quietly. Um, let me guess, if Simic dies, you're next in line. It's not like this. The Avrai has already determined that my soul isn't strong enough. Whoever follows my father, it won't be me. So basically we have two choices here, um, between either, uh, fine, I'll poison your father, or Simic's right, I'm going to help him. Mm. Simic's right, I'm going to help him. Savage all! With another glance at Simic's chamber, he backs toward the door. I'm warning you now, Estramora, stay away from Vela, if my father's son in at least one regard. Hey. Okay. Okay, so we're pretty much on the path to uh, taking Vela. Now, we've been streaming for about four hours, and my voice is getting tired from all the reading, so I'm going to call the stream here. Uh, next stream will be Persona 4 Roy, uh, Persona 4 Royal. Persona 4 of the Golden, once more. Uh, we'll be doing some training in the uh, TV world, and then continuing on with the storyline. Uh and then, uh, of course, after that, we'll be back to uh, Pillars. Anyways, I hope you all had a fantastic night. I uh, hope you have a fantastic weekend as well. If you've been enjoying it, I do hope that you uh, give a, a follow. Always happy to get those. And as always, I will be posting the VOD up to my uh, YouTube channel for archive purposes. Uh, in the meantime, let me actually send you over to Thorman Gander. He's playing World of Horror, which is a fantastic uh, kind of roguelike uh, RPG uh, based on uh, Jinji Ito, who was a uh, manga artist and um, kind of like Lovecraft, Lovecrafting and themes. And it's a really fun game. Actually, my first stream I ever did was um, a double feature of World of Horror and Monster Prom. So it is really a fantastic game. It has just seen its uh, full release on the 19th. It was in uh, Early Access for a while. One of the few games I ever got in Early Access and well worth it. Um, definitely a, uh, a real gem. Uh, it has a fantastic uh, retro style. Um, 
you know, a lot of replayability, a lot of things you can unlock. Just wonderful, wonderful game. And yeah, that raid should be going in just a few moments now. About half a moment. Half a, half a moment. Half a minute. Hey. But anyways, yes. Um, I am very thankful for uh, all the... Um, Uh, all the views, and definitely I'm looking forward to uh, seeing y'all in the future. Okay, in rage, be going in time now. Almost there. Five, four, three, two, one. Have a good one.